Chapter 511 Before the Departure The rain had come to a stop, a rainbow bridge galloping across the skies of Mayenna, draping the fortress with a blanket of rich colors. Mayenna's plaza, a place where people seldom gathered, saw half the city's citizens swarming the place. Hundreds of civilians were gathered in this place, curious about what would happen. Whispers and discussions broke out everywhere. Standing on the wooden stage of execution were Jurga, Geralt, Matteo, Vicenna, the bald deputy, a mangled, maggot-infested human corpse, and the carcass of a gigantic wolf. Citizens, for eight days we've investigated the death of our honorary ambassador, Ains. After eight painstaking days, we finally discerned the cause of his death, Rid announced. Long gone was his panic and dejection, replaced by delight and excitement. Some of the civilians were whipped into a frenzy, their faces red, and they roared. That merchant of Rivia killed him, he and the Witcher. Hang them, no, tie them to the stakes, burn them. They're not witches, you buffoon. The people swung their fists, roaring and shouting for the murderers to be put down, their overzealous rage scaring Yurga. Geralt, however, folded his arms, looking unfazed, and he looked at his mother. Silence, let me speak. The investigation veered the wrong way from the start. Ains was in fact not kidnapped at all. This feral beast here killed him. Rit pointed at the wolf's corpse. The people turned their attention to the corpse, and a collective gasp pierced the air. By Lebiota, are the end days upon us? A heavily freckled man spoke in astonishment. I've never seen a wolf this big my whole life. Because you don't go around enough, a pot-bellied man scoffed. Oversized beasts exist, just gotta travel to the northmost part of the lands and venture into Dragon Mountains. This beast took up residence in the bushes behind the wooden bridge of the valley in the north, ambushing passing townspeople. Rit looked at the concerned people. Ains and Yurga were on their way back from the woods when the wolf ambushed them. Ains was killed on the spot, his corpse devoured. We sent a troop of soldiers into the woods for a search, and a lot were injured before we found the corpse and killed the beast. Yurga and everyone else, shocked by the horrible encounter, conjured up a delusion and spouted nonsense when they came back. What proof do you have? A lanky man shouted. Like most people, he believed the conspiracy theory about Ains being kidnapped and killed by his competitor. That made for a more intriguing story than a mere beast attack. Mateo, Ains's servant, is our witness, along with our beloved healer. Vizena took a step forward and nodded at the people, giving them a smile. Her smile alone soothed their doubts and rage. I have ascertained that this is the corpse of Ains. He was torn to pieces by this beast, and I have also found pieces of his flesh in the beast's belly. The healer's right, a lad with a crutch shouted. He had the look of a devout believer on his face. If that's what the healer says, then that must be the case, the other civilians agreed. Vizena had helped them before, so they were indebted to her. Some people voiced their doubts, but their suspicion was drowned out easily which makes Geralt, Jurga, and Matteo innocents, Rit shouted. Release them! That is what I shall do right now. I hereby pronounce that their accusations of kidnapping are dropped. We shall duly compensate them for our wrongful accusations against them. What a fool, a young boy mocked. Spent eight days and this is what you found, and you accused three innocents. The crowd burst into laughter, and Rit's face fell, but he held his fury back. This is no foolishness, boy. This is what the gods had in store for us. This is what the eternal fire wanted for us, said Rit righteously. This mistake led us to Ains's well-kept secret during our investigations. What kind of secret? Despite his status and power as our ambassador, Ains not only did not uphold his duties, he abused his power and committed a list of heinous crimes. One, the food he purchased for the refugees is made of moldy and expired ingredients. The people inhaled sharply. A short, pudgy man with a face full of acne held his belly. No wonder my stomach gets upset for the whole day every time I have food Ains bought. His friend teased. You go into the refugee encampment? Hey, free food is free food. Don't tell me you aren't tempted. Shut it, I am not done yet, Rit continued. Two, he has forced more than five women in the encampment to serve him in bed. He promised them heaven and earth and yet he left them to fend for themselves. The bastard that riled the crowd up, he has the looks of a shit-eating maggot, forced women into servitude just because he had money, 
Damn him. That scum, that beast did well, it did. The men roared with indignity and jealousy. He got it easy. If it were up to me, I'd have hung him in the plaza and cut his junk off. An effeminate man hissed. A plain-looking man sighed. The gods are unfair. I've been honest all my life, but I've never even held a woman's hand before. That's because you have no gold to your name, a minor aristocrat scoffed. Rit was happy about the people's reaction. Their rage was finally redirected to Ains. 3. For the last ten years, Ans had been in cahoots with the bandits terrorizing the wilds beyond the walls, robbing and killing the merchants that got into a contract with him, taking their cargo for free. Up until his death, he had killed no fewer than a hundred merchants. A soldier walked up to Rit and handed a thick black tome. This is the ledger we found in his estate. Every single illegal transaction he made is recorded in these pages. There is no denial of his crimes now. Rit did his best to wag the tome around, riling up the people more. Do you know what this means? Ains fattened himself up with the coins he gained from killing his partners, but in turn, Mayena lost a huge number of businesses, taxes, and job opportunities. Like a conductor for an orchestra, Rit swung his arms down and made a circle. Thanks to Ains, all of you are making less money than you should. The bastard, a young aristocrat in a green scarf spat, crossing their arms before their chest. So he's the reason things are getting pricier while profits get lower? That is correct, Rit continued loudly. Ains was nothing but a parasite, a bloodsucker. As long as he was there, the people would have lived nothing but miserable lives. The corrupted evil bastard, a bald man roared. A demon in human skin, the farmer shouted. Yay, yay, he's dead. A girl sitting on her father's head clapped merrily. The people were cursing and spitting at the dead ambassador. His death is divine retribution and a chance for this city to change. Our wise and revered Lord Scorpy will be taking advantage of this change to breathe new life into the city. A pause ensued, and Rit turned red with excitement as he was reminded of the encouragement his boss gave him. Animatedly, he announced, From next month onward, Lord Scorpi will lower the prices of all items in this city. He has promised that prices will not rise again. Within six months, prices will keep going down until they hit normal levels. The details will be posted on the bulletin board in Town Hall. Everyone's invited to check it out. Hail Lord Scorpi. Long live Lord Scorpi. After so much suffering, the people finally got some good news, and they shouted and cheered in glee. On top of that, they could vent their frustration at the snobbish and arrogant ambassador, and that was cathartic for them. With that, the whole fiasco surrounding Ains's death came to an end. If you run into any trouble, Yugni, come to the ballroom in Novigrad's business district and tell them Roy sent you. I'll help however I can. Aukis, I mean Roy, I don't know what to say. Don't mind it, you've helped me out too. Rit gave you some gold, didn't he, Mateo? I have a yeah, suggestion. Take Rurin and leave Mayena right away. This place does nothing for you. You have to leave to escape your past. Don't think about them. Try your best to distract yourself and perhaps sire a child. This is important. Your life depends on this, got it? Glasses clanged and the aroma of malt flared in the air, the foam glistening like pearls. Thank you, Roy. Got out with my life intact thanks to you. Yurga had changed into cheap, oversized clothes and he was grinning. Let's go to my place. Pick any of my sons you'd like. Train him up to be a witcher. The merchant thumped his chest. Roy looked at the excited merchant, amused. It was his first time seeing someone willingly give up their children to a witcher, but the orphanage was in no need of more kids. So how old are they? Twelve. Both of them are. Sorry, but they're a bit old. The trial will be dangerous for them, Roy said. Ebony was under the table, lapping up some dwarven liquor. He was listening to the tune of the lute, shaking his leg like he was under a spell. Yurga looked slightly disappointed. They're twins, so I guess both of them are my firstborns. If you won't take them with you, inheritance is going to be a problem when they come of age. If you love them equally, then split their inheritance equally between them. You have a point. I'm going to make a lot from this deal anyway. For some reason, the deputy became a lot more agreeable, waved me two years' worth of business tax in Mayena. Yurga looked pleasantly surprised. Roy smiled, at least the deputy is not a total idiot, 
he turned to Geralt. What did the deputy give you? Two hundred orins. Geralt gulped his beer down and wiped off the foam. All I had to take were some lashes. It's a good deal. Roy raised a toast, staring at Geralt with interest. This is none of my business, but how did your talk with Vizena go? And a short pause slid itself into the otherwise merry occasion. In the original timeline, Geralt was heavily injured when he met his mother. Vizena kept running away from the questions Geralt posed. When Geralt passed out, Vizena ran away, and Geralt never saw her again until the day he died. This time, Geralt had the upper hand thanks to Roy's intervention, and Vizena didn't manage to run away. It would have been a shame if Vizena and Geralt had gone their own paths and never talked again, even after the conversation. Geralt let go of his glass and leaned in his chair, staring at the magical lamp on the inn ceiling. You might think I'm a joke. Being a witcher means cutting off our old lives, including our old families. That's what Vesemir had told me so many times. Eskel and Lambert followed that rule, or to be exact, this path didn't give them any chance to contact their family, but I could never seem to forget about my mother. I had always wished to see her. That's not what most witchers would do. He finished his beer, a shade of red painting his pale cheeks. No such rule in the Brotherhood, Gerald, said Roy loudly. We're moving with the times. How we work, mutate, and deal with world affairs are changing too. We're dealing with family affairs differently too. Roy said seriously, take me for example. I've been in this line of work for three years, but have I estranged myself from Moore or Susie? Gerald shook his head. Have their lives been badly affected by my presence, or is it the opposite? The opposite, Gerald thought, and they gave you a brother too. The rule of cutting off your family and taking on the fate of cold loneliness after you become a witcher is in the past now. Roy smiled proudly. We should look forward and go after new dreams. We do not just exist to help humans with their monster infestations or personal affairs. Not like we have a serious monster infestation either. We should work for one thing only, to change the lives of ourselves, our families, our friends, and our lovers. Roy raised his voice and fervently said, so everyone can be happy. Yurga's jaw dropped. He couldn't believe a witcher would suhus that. I something so unbelievable. It sounded so impossible, but so inspirational. That was the goal most people were working toward, not just witchers. Vizena's your mother. She had a reason to leave you, but she's been missing you. It's normal that you want to get close to her. So it's fine if I stay in contact with her? Geralt looked at Roy. Of course. Rot patted his shoulder. It'd be confusing if you left without saying a word, puerile and melodramatic. Geralt looked sheepish. He did plan on leaving without saying a word. You finally found her. Reconnected with her. Don't let go so easily, Roy encouraged. Spend some time nurturing the connection. Don't have to keep an eye on it all the time. Just occasional visits to let her know you're fine would be good enough. The look of dilemma melted off Geralt's face, replaced by a smile. He then patted the head of Ebony, and the pup stopped shaking his leg for a while. Then Ebony pranced around happily, howling quietly with the screaming and dancing patrons on the dance floor. I've always loved your analyses, straight to the point and motivational. Analyses? No. This is a prophecy. Roy beamed. You should be thankful, because those who have heard my prophecies will gain happiness. Um, Yurga rubbed his hands and grinned. Can you give me a prophecy as well? You're going to have another child. Yurga's jaw dropped, and liquor rattled in his throat, about to be spewed. Roy lashed out and covered the merchant's mouth until the red-faced merchant gulped his liquor down. Kidding. You'll have a surprise waiting for you at home nonetheless. The merchant burped and shot Roy a look of complaint. It took him a long while to calm down from the shock. Can we set off tomorrow? I'd like to make some purchases for Golden Cheeks and the boys later. Gerald said nothing. He only brought up the law of surprise on a whim. He wasn't planning on taking his son or any of his pickled greens or dried fish. I have to find Siri, so I can't go with you, Yurga. I'm sorry. Do you have anywhere better to be? Roy smiled. You never invoke the law of surprise on a whim. The law carries with it the power of destiny. You did say that should you pass this trial of imprisonment, you'll have passed the trial of destiny. Now it's time to receive your reward. Roy said mysteriously. Perhaps what you're looking for is right there. 
Outer Rivia isn't far from Mayenna. Anticipation flared within Geralt's heart, and he didn't argue anymore. Then it settled. Roy downed a glass of alcohol, and he turned red with excitement. We'll set off with Yurga tomorrow. One thing I don't understand. Yurga smacked his belly, and it jiggled. What was that light? Are we really gonna just ignore it? Smells like trouble, Roy said. It's shown on you for five minutes. Feel unwell. The opposite, actually. I feel a lot lighter, stronger. It healed my arthritis, too, or I couldn't have survived life in prison. Kindness is rewarded. Maybe that light really is some sort of divine spell. Punishment for the wicked and blessing for the kind. Couldn't find anything even when I tried to look around the woods. Roy had a wary look in his eyes. The memory of Matteo getting burned by the light was fresh in his head, and he felt something familiar from the light, too. The druids of Mayenna are starting their search. They will contact me once they find something. Who's it going to be? Geralt cocked his eyebrow. The lovely Vizena. Exchange contacts with her. Roy whipped out a magic crystal, ignoring the dark look on Geralt's face. With anticipation in his voice, he said, Perhaps I might ask her a lot about the path of nature. And try to get her to be a part of the Brotherhood's lab members. I didn't know you learned a thing or two from Lambert. I'm warning you, don't try anything funny with her, or I'm telling Lita about it. I'm sure she'll give you a piece of her mind. Just kidding, Gerald. You know I'm chasing power, and I'm not interested in someone 200 years older than me. The beautiful wilds of Mayena sheltering the Druid Circle saw something peculiar happen that day. A Druid draped in bear hide, a pair of antlers coupled with mistletoe wreaths took a mountain flower off his forehead, his face covered in feral tattoos. Once he sorted out the plant's message, his eyes burned with flames hot enough to immolate anything he set his eyes on. A second energy field, this time fifteen dead. Someone's experimenting on our turf. No matter who they are, they will pay the price. Chapter 512, Series Journey Night fell upon the land, shimmering stars lining up in the skies, converging into a silver river. The wilds were silent. Underneath a great boulder stood a Nilfgaardian warhorse clad in black. A gentle breeze brushed across the crackling flames, sparks and smoke billowing in the air. A girl was sitting beside the bonfire, clad in a silver cloak, shivering and sneezing. A tear glistened in her eyes. You have to eat, your highness, the raspy voice of a man said, and his shadow loomed over the girl. He extended his hand, a glistening golden-brown rabbit's leg sleeping within his palm. The meat was not seasoned in the least bit, but the girl was at her growing age, and even an unseasoned rabbit's leg was a delicacy for her. The desire to eat flashed in her eyes, and she licked her lips, but she snorted and turned her head away, curling up even more. The man crouched before the girl. He had black hair, blue eyes, and a handsome face. He observed the princess carefully, the light of excitement glinting in his eyes. She was a perfectly beautiful specimen, and he wished to protect her. You can't go on like this. Not eating or drinking any is going to kill you before we get to our destination. You might not know how it feels to starve to death, but I can tell you, it's painful. The man stared at Siri and started depicting a gory scene. Bile's going to burn through your belly and travel up your digestive tract and shoot straight into your throat. The girl's eyelid twitched, and then it'll eat through your tongue, teeth, and lips. Then it'll ruin your pretty little face and burn your body. Siri shivered, and she turned a shade whiter. Then her face turned green, but she clenched her teeth tight and refused to talk. You do not have to do this, your highness. The knight heaved a sigh and wrapped the rabbit leg in parchment paper. Then he whipped out a water skin from the saddlebag and placed it on the fern beside her. You're still young. You shouldn't be suffering out here. You can live as comfortably as you want, and in the name of knights, I promise that if you do as I say and don't try to run away, you'll be living in luxury once we get back to Nilfgaard. You'll still be as respected by the people, and you'll have the most powerful man backing you up. No one will ever harm you again. Nilfgaard? The mention of that nightmarish place incited fury within Ciri, and she clenched her fists. She gnashed her teeth, and her cheeks puffed. You villain! Nilfgaard invaded my home. Ciri leapt from the boulder and stood as tall as she could, facing the gigantic Nilgardian soldier that was clad in a muddy black cloak. 
She swung her fists at him. You burned my home, killed my friends, murdered my family, and now you're taking me back to your kingdom to, to make me a puppet? Fury flared in the girl's eyes, but she posed no threat at all, no matter how menacing she tried to be. I will not let you do as you please. I'd rather die of starvation if the alternative is to be taken back to Nilfgaard. The princess roars did not phase the knight a bit. Instead, he tensed up, and the look on his face hardened. His black eyes flickered coldly, the light of the bonfire failing to warm up his face. That look again? After her threats failed, Ciri took a step back and cowered, covering her face as she cried. Grandfather, grandmother, Gerald, Roy, someone save me. Her cries echoed into the night, traveling across the wilds. Kasira massaged his forehead, frustrated but also glad at the same time. He was an aristocrat and an elite of Nilfgaard's intel department, yet he was being plunged into a problem because of a child. If the king had more trust in the spellcasters, they could have just opened a portal and brought Ciri back, but if that was the case, he would never have had the chance to approach the princess. She might be young, but there was great charisma coming from her, captivating the attention of those around her. Kasira never regretted this trip. Be quiet, your highness. R tried his best to speak softly. Don't push me. I do not wish to use force to make you quiet. This again? You're all liars, you bastards! Grandfather, grandmother, save me! In an act of rebellion, the princess cried even louder. And then the woods behind Kasira rustled. He tensed up and turned around, holding his scabbard with one hand and the hilt of his sword in the other, his eyes fixed on the bushes. The princess too had noticed the tension in the air, Rolf and her cries came to an abrupt halt. She rubbed her puffy eyes and quieted her breathing, stealing glances at the bushes behind them, her eyes gleaming with cunning. Kasira crouched and slowly approached the bushes. Then he froze. There was the screech of metal dragging across the ground as a burly knight in armor came out of the bushes, his blade glinting under the flames of the bonfire. He wore a dark gold helmet with a pair of wings jutting out of its sides, and a Y-shaped gap adorned its visor, revealing his sharp gaze and pursed lips. The helmet resembled the ones Nilfgaardian soldiers wore, and he had a greatsword behind his back. With every step the knight took, the sword would drag out a line behind him. Knight of Nilfgaard, release the child right away. If you do, then in the name of a knight's honor, I shall let you live, said the knight righteously. And who might you be? Where do you come from? I am but a wandering knight from Toussaint, here on a journey to explore the north. My name bears no weight. You seem to be a knight from Nilfgaard. Pray tell, why did you abandon the virtues taught to us to kidnap a child? The knight questioned sharply. Kasira frowned. He was wondering why a knight from Toussaint would show up in the wilds out of nowhere. But that wasn't the point. This knight was a veteran, and he had incredible control over his body and strength. This was not an opponent he could trifle with. I am here on orders of Nilfgaard's royal steward. Do not obstruct my duty, knight of Toussaint. Toussaint was Nilfgaard's vassal state. This knight shouldn't be stopping him. Or you shall be punished for obstruction of military work, and that crime is punishable by death. Toussaint will not lend a hand to evil. Very well, if you refuse to be apprehended, then we shall duel. The knight with the golden helmet swung his broadsword. Have it thee! Kasira cursed, but the knight didn't care. He swung his broadsword down at the Nilfgaardian's head. The air roared, and a wave of power rained down on Kasira, trying to slice him in two. The Nilfgaardian's eyes went wide, and suffocation was setting in fast. His cloak billowed in the air, and Kasira quickly rolled away from the first swing. The other knight's sword hit the ground, stirring up a small storm, leaving a mark on the ground. Once again, he set his eyes on Kasira. Sweat drenched the Nilfgaardian's hair and back. What a madman! By eternal fire's name, is this where I die? A horse's shrill neigh pierced the air and the knight's duel came to a stop. To their surprise, the girl had climbed up the horse's back, leaning on the saddle as she tugged on the reins. The girl then looked at them. She was ghostly white, but her eyes were filled with excitement and smug delight. Ciri had seen a lot of those winged helmets before. They were Nilfgaardian helmets, so these men were both villains. Well, she didn't mind that they were fighting each other, though. Farewell, fools. 
A surge of magic flowed into the saddle, and the horse calmed down. It was now following Ciri's orders, ignoring its master's shrill whistles. The beast charged into the bushes with the princess on its back, and it galloped into the distance, leaving the knights behind, confused. Curse you, ye mongrel. I shall bring this to Raymond, and demand that he behead you. Raymond has relieved me of all duties, in the name of knight's honor, if you do not tell me the whole story of how you came to possess the child and confess your sins, I will make you pay. The horse's gallop echoed in the night, as the beast zipped through the wilds. Siri leaned as close to the horse's back as possible, holding its mane and clasping her legs around its back as tightly as she could. The ride was a bumpy one, and the horse did not slow down. Gusts of wind cut across her face, draining even more blood from the already pale princess. The violent bumps were threatening to throw her off the horse's back, but Siri gritted her teeth. You can do this, Siri. Farther. Even farther. Even her breath was turned into mist, fogging her vision. Her arms and legs were getting sore at a blistering rate, but the horse kept galloping, taking the princess to a destination yet unknown. And then, the girl's strength failed her, sapping her of her consciousness until everything turned black. A groan permeated the air. You're awake, child. Who are you? And where am I? Siri woke up in a trundling cart, and the first thing she saw was an old, wrinkly woman with thin, blonde hair. She tried to push herself up, but a stab of pain seared up her arms, and she flinched. Her arms quickly swelled. Her legs were screaming out in agony as well. Moving them even an inch felt like hell. Her legs felt like lead. Do not move, child. You fell from a horse's back and bruised yourself hard. Frankly, it's a miracle you got out of it alive and without broken bones. The lady smiled at her, revealing an almost toothless mouth. Call me Suha. We're a group of refugees trying to make it to Sodden. Suha looked ahead. They were in a long line of refugees made up of people who lost their homes to the war. People of Sintra, most were women and children. The women were holding their children and saddled with a lot of packs on their backs. They looked exhausted and vacant. Less than one in five refugees were men. Most men had died in the war. What about Sintra? What happened to it? Siri quickly asked. The Nilfgaardian soldier told her nothing while she was his captive, nor did she hear anything about her grandparents. Suha heaved a sigh, the look on her face filled with sorrow, and her hair swayed. The great Sintra has fallen. Nilfgaard broke through the gates, burned our city down, and killed many of our brethren. What about the queen? and the king. Dead. All Sintra nobles committed suicide by poison. None bowed to the southern bastards. The king and queen died in battle, valiantly preserving what was left of Sintra and pride. My grandparents are dead? Siri became whiter than a ghost, and her eyes went wide, sobs of fear rushing out of her mouth, but grandmother was still in the castle, alive and well before I was taken away. Now she's dead? Impossible. Tears streamed down her cheeks. You must be a Sintran too, child. Did you get separated from your family? Sua lovingly patted Siri's unkempt hair. I used to have a granddaughter, but oh, don't cry. Don't cry. I'm here. I promise I'll take you to Sodden and find your family. No, I don't think you can ever find them again. The tearful princess looked around, but all she saw was a broken land and unfamiliar faces. The air was heavy with despair, and loneliness and fear filled her heart. What should I do? Where should I go? What is your name, child? S Falca, I'm Falca. Vicenna had moved her tent back to a clearing in the woods, and Siri was standing before Suha, who was lying on a rug made of hay. She was wearing clothes made out of cheap fabric, and there were holes in her pants. Her shirt was heavily patched, while her shoes were so worn out, her toes were peeking through. She looked like a boy. Her face was filthy, and gone was her usual look of delight, replaced by bruises and wounds. Her eyes weren't as clear as before, riddled with stories she kept a secret. Fighting with the boys again, Falca? Never back off. Anyone tries to harm you, you fight back. Bite them, scratch them, use any weapon you have, but never give in. I'm sorry I can't go on with you any longer. Suha coughed. I should have listened to you and went to Novigrad instead of Sodden. We're in a right mess now. Didn't Final. D your family, and I got you into another mess. Suha was having difficulty speaking, and her chest heaved, her voice was hoarse and raspy, and her hair had lost its luster. 
She was cadaverous, the air around her smelling like decay and death. The old lady held Siri's hand, and she weakly said, I, I wanted to give you a home, but she coughed. Who'd have thought that? Sodden would fall as well. Damn the Southerners. Another cough escaped her throat. Falka, you have, you have to take care of yourself now. No, Suha. Don't leave me alone here, please. Siri held her hand, her eyes glistening with tears. I am sorry, Zaina will take care of you now. And those were her last words. Her eyes and mouth remained open, as if she wanted to see Siri as long as she could, and she drew her last breath. Siri held the woman's rough, dry hand against her face and sobbed. Why? Why does everyone leave me? What did I do to deserve this? Zaina was sitting on the other side of the rug. She was in blue attire, and there was a mysterious air about her. She closed Sua's eyes and looked at Siri quietly. Falka, you're still young, and you're a good child. You deserve a second chance at life. Lady, please take me and her to Novigrad, please. I know Geralt and Roy can save her. The girl stared at the druid with tearful eyes. I'm afraid not even gods can bring back the dead. There are too many casualties here in Sodden, and so many need my help. I cannot take you all the way to Novigrad. Zaina shook her head and turned to the east of the village. I can only... A commotion broke out outside the tent, interrupting the doctor. She and Siri took a peek and saw a man in a black cloak checking out all the tents, apparently searching for something. The dim light coming from the skies above shone on that mean, revealing a pair of black eyes, sharp nose, and thin, ugly lips. Siri stopped breathing for a moment and curled up in the corner, fidgeting. She knew this man. The last time they met, he didn't have a scar, but this time he did, and the scar extended from his forehead to his chin. Yet Siri would never forget that face. He was no Kassira, but he too was a villain. Back in Sintra, he was the one who cast the spell that stopped Geralt from taking her away. Obviously, he had plans for her. You know this man, Falka? Siri nodded and clasped her hands before her belly, her face riddled with fear and nervousness. Is he your enemy? Fear not, child. Zaina held down on the girl's shoulder and motioned for her to sit in front of the rug. She had an assuring gaze, and the druid said confidently, As long as I am here, he will never lay a finger on you, not even if he is a sorcerer. Well, he's also blind now. Zaina waved her hand, and a layer of green light enveloped Siri, calming her heart down. The girl held her breath lest any sound gave her away. The man with the scar eventually came to their tent and looked inside. He observed the corpse on the rug, and his gaze went right across Siri, as if he hadn't seen her. Then the man went away, his footsteps eventually disappearing into the distance. Falka, you are a special person, and so is the energy residing within you. Still, you are not to be a part of nature or the woods. I cannot take you back to the circle or teach you anything. The druid shook her head regrettably. However, I will take you to a well-off family on the border between Sodden and Rivia. The lady of the house is one named Golden Cheeks. She is a beautiful, gentle, and sympathetic soul. Her husband is a righteous man, though he is always out and about making trades. They also have a pair of healthy sons, though they'd always wanted a daughter. You can be their adopted child, Falka. There, you will find a new lease on life. There, you will face your destiny. Once you're more capable, you can travel to Novigrad, but not before the war draws to a close. Siri was silent for a long time, and she looked at her deceased Suha. The girl quickly wiped her tears with her sleeve, and she nodded. Chapter 513 Something Else The center of Sodden was a place draped in a blanket of fog, and a young witcher was standing within it, staring at the base of the Hill of the Eight. He was covered in layers of golden and black light while a beautiful fluorescent circle sat under his feet. He stared around the fog, searching for the ethereal gray ribbon floating in the air. He turned his sights to the side of the hill and noticed a bush of blooming yellow flowers, then his medallion started to buzz. The witcher made a sign, and a crimson rune appeared in his palm. His mana conjured up a ball of flame, and the fireball hurtled out of his palm, arcing across the air and tearing apart the fog that was blurring his sight. Shrill screams pierced the air, shattering it like glass. The humanoid creature within the fog was forced out of hiding from the impact of the explosion, and it fell face-first to the ground. The monster had a hunched back, 
but its limbs were slender and long, and it resembled a misshapen, disfigured pregnant woman late in her gestation period. The flames slithered up its skin like a viper, burning it. Yet the monster was blinking in and out of reality, threatening to disappear at any moment. Roy fired a bolt, and the creature fell to the ground, a blotch of red spurting from its head. The impact crushed half its skull, and its brains drenched the grass beneath. The creature fell headfirst, and it never got back up again. Foglet killed. EXP plus 130. Level 12 Witcher 88 Feast 1500. Roy approached the mangled corpse and started cutting it up. His pets poked their heads out, looking around curiously. At the same time, the fog that was covering the hill went away, revealing a small hill surrounded by lush greenery. It was a lot less impressive than the hill in the stories. You got faster, Roy. Um, Geralt approached the young witcher, leading his faithful mare. You gotta work hard, Geralt. Don't lag behind too much. Roy whipped out a blue mutagen from the monster's corpse, wiped the mucus off it, and tucked it into his inventory space. Try to get the slot for the next second mutation. Can I go through the mutation too, witchers? Yurga, who was driving the carriage, simpered. You're not even a witcher, and you're too old to even learn new tricks. For people your age, only one in one hundred can come out alive. You're welcome to try. Roy smiled warmly, and the merchant cringed. Forget it. Should we check out the obelisk for the martyrs on the hill? Of course. What about the carriage? Griffon and Ebony will keep an eye on it. All the potential hazards nearby have been cleared, so there shouldn't be much trouble. Griffon the cat held Ebony by the nape of its neck and climbed up to the coach's seat, then it waved the three humans goodbye. One week had gone by since their departure from Mayena, and Yurga was used to the pet's extraordinary intellect. He thought it was all thanks to the witcher's training. The three of them climbed up the mountain and got to the top in ten minutes. A breeze blew across the plateau, the grass and flowers swaying in the wind. An obelisk sat in the center of the hill's peak. It was made of granite and weighed ten tons. The obelisk looked like a small tower with a sharp, pointy top, much like a pyramid's. The base was wide enough that it would require a few men to even surround it. The moment Roy laid eyes on the obelisk, he knew his earlier guess was wrong. This construct was not made by the people of Sodden to keep the martyrs in memoriam. They didn't have that kind of ability, and they were seeking shelter after the war took their homes, far too busy to even make an obelisk. Which meant it must have been the sorcerers who made the obelisk, or at least they magically transported the obelisk here. Under the obelisk were eight graves with marble gravestones and vibrant flowers slept nearby, rhododendrons, forget-me-nots, and more. Geralt scanned the first few names engraved on the obelisk, Laudbor, Gorazd, Axel. Reminiscence twinkled in his eyes, but his gaze low, Okid sad. You know them? Roy heaved a sigh of relief. There were six fewer deaths than he remembered. Coral and Triss's names were not found here. Obviously, history had changed thanks to him. He called out the first name on the obelisk. Laudbor? Who's that? Used to be a gambler and a sore loser. Geralt shook his head amusement flaring in his eyes, then it was replaced by a solemn look. There was this one time where I played dice with him back in Vizima, he was so scared of losing, he used magic to control me, and cheated his way to victory. Ah, so even sorcerers cheat? They're even worse than us merchants. Yurga puffed his chest out and spoke in disdain. It wasn't every day he got to take the high ground against sorcerers. I ran into Goraz two years ago. A madman, he was. You know what he wanted to do? Geralt paused for a moment and forced a smile. Said he'd give me a hundred crowns if I would let him check my eyes. If I was willing to go further, he'd give me a thousand just to cut my eye open for a check. Yurga cringed a little like he was stung by a bee. Sweat drenched his face, and horror crept into his eyes. Are they mad? Are all sorcerers like that? They'd perform autopsies on live humans? That's what a long life gets you twists your heart and mind a little. Roy shook his head, thinking it was a shame. What a pity. You should have told me about him. If I'd known about that guy, I'd have inducted him into the Brotherhood. He could have done all the experiments he wanted on mutations. At least he was willing to follow the rules. He was willing to pay and even asked for your consent. I get the feeling you're going a bit too far, Roy. You have Lita, Kalkstein, 
Triss, and Evelyn on your side now. Isn't that enough? The first Witcher Brotherhood had a dozen sorcerers working with them back in their prime. Top sorcerers. Roy shook his head. We're just starting out. We still have a long way to go. Geralt shook his head. If he didn't know better, he would have thought Roy was a dictatorial maniac who was trying to create a new world order. Unbeknownst to Geralt, what Roy was aiming for was something much bigger than the world. So, friendly neighborhood witcher Geralt, do you know the other names of those who died? Yurga asked, his eyes filled with anticipation. The stories of these sorcerers would work wonders should he want to regale the other merchants or his family with wondrous tales, or he could use them to negotiate for some favors. Geralt fell into silence, a hint of fear flashing on his face. He scanned the first few names and turned away awkwardly, fear and worry flitting in his eyes. He was too scared to check out all the names, lest he find the one name he didn't want to. Roy hatched a plan. A small smile tugged on his lips, and he sighed. You shouldn't have gotten in that fight with her, Gerald. What do you mean? Gerald forced himself to ask that question. He wobbled a little and tensed up, clenching his fists. I was going to have you introduce me to Yennefer of Vengerberg sometime. You know, the woman you have, have a complex past with, but you wouldn't stop changing the topic, said you guys are over and would never talk again. Well, too late, even if you want to talk to her now. Roy paused for a moment and grabbed a bouquet of purple bell flowers out of thin air. Take this, Geralt, and say a proper goodbye this time. The white wolf held his breath, and a strangled gasp escaped his throat. His eyes were filled with terror, his hands and lips trembling, and he went a shade whiter. The witcher hunched over, life flying out of his body. The light went out of his eyes, and his face slumped. Hey, don't scare me, mate. Roy quickly grabbed Geralt's shoulders and pinched his sagging cheeks, then he put on an awkward smile. Just kidding. Yennefer's not on the list. They're all nameless sorcerers. Isn't that right, Yurga? I have no idea about the name you just said, Roy. The sorrow on Geralt's face was wiped out, taken over by fury. He quickly made a sign and slammed R. Day into Roy's chest. The impact sent Roy tumbling down, and he rolled, howling in pain. The young witcher rolled into the path of grass and fell down the hill, his screams cutting through the air. Yurga looked at the furious white wolf carefully and gulped. He will be fine, won't he, Geralt? Geralt shook his head in disdain. He survived two months of disappearance after Sintra's fall and came back stronger. Not even a higher vampire could kill him. This little roll won't even leave a mark on his skin. The fury disappeared as quickly as it came. Geralt eased up, and a smile curled his lips. Knowing that the most important person of his life was still alive perked him up. A gentle voice spoke from behind. So, calm down now? Geralt and Yurga shivered and turned around. Roy stood about five yards away, his face covered in dust and soil, and he smiled apologetically at Geralt. He lost his left shoe, revealing his foot to the ground underneath. The young witcher probably lost the shoe on his way down the hill. Yurga rubbed his eyes and turned his sights to the slope, then he whirled around. How did he come back so fast? I can always roll down the hill again if that's what it takes for you to calm down, Geralt. Geralt massaged his temples. Roy's changed a little. Is he in his rebellious phase? Well, he is at that age. Must be the reason. Don't joke with me about Yennefer, Roy. No next time, Roy swore, raising his hand. But then he said, she might have survived the battle, but she did not leave unscathed. Geralt cocked his eyebrow. He wouldn't fall for Roy's tricks this time. Since Geralt wasn't taking the bait, Roy continued, You know Yennefer. She has her own ambition. She must have joined this battle, and she did not walk away unhurt. Coral and Triss were supposed to join this battle. According to my prophecy, they were supposed to die on this very hill. But thanks to my guidance, they escaped their demise and came out unscathed. Geralt crossed his arms, watching Roy continue his show. The Northern Brotherhood of Sorcerers has taken part in this bid for power between the South and the North. From now on, they'll be more involved in the fields of war and politics. From what I know, Yennefer is going to be one of the two administrators of the Brotherhood and the youngest council member. Whether she likes it or not, she can never escape this long war. The dangers she will have to face run deeper than you can imagine. One wrong step and she is done for.
Gerald's breathing got heavier. Roy said, Compared to her, Coral's having it easy. All she has to do is work on her research all day, every day. Working with us witchers is a good path to go forward. Realization struck Gerald, and he was partly amused by Roy's suggestion, and he was partly annoyed. All that just to convince me to lure Yennefer into joining us? Luring? Why, you're not luring her. You're just concerned about her. No one can change Yennefer's mind, Roy. Not even me. Besides, we cut off contact a long time ago. Please don't tell me you still believe that. Ask yourself, do you still love her? You're the man, so make the first move. Roy said imperiously. Stop acting like a young couple in love who won't even communicate their problems. Write a letter. Ask her if she's fine. Tell her how you feel about the separation. Then talk about Siri. Tell her you found her, but you have no idea how to deal with the girl. Tell her you need her help. She'll be very interested in it, I promise. First, Siri's whereabouts are still unknown. Second, even if we find her, the orphanage has enough people to handle her, Gerald argued. But he was obviously tempted by the prospect. You know how much Yennefer wants a child. Roy stared into Geralt's eyes. She can't conceive, but the bond created by destiny is every bit as close and powerful as the bond between real parents and children. Think about it, Geralt. Take all the time you need. A freckled, pudgy boy was charging down the clear stream, flailing his arms around like a boar playing with water. The radiant sun shone upon his brown, neatly cut hair, granting it a lustrous sheen. He pointed at a sharp-nosed boy who was as thin as a bamboo, shouting, You'll be the drowner, while I'll be the witcher. No way! The thin boy swung his stick and hit the pudgy boy's chest, and the pudgy boy tumbled into the water. Witchers aren't fat and clumsy. You're the drowner in this case. Splashes broke out across the stream as the brothers started tussling and rolling around, though they were all staring at the riverbank. A scrawny girl with gray hair sat beside the pebbles, swirling her feet in the stream water. There was a dazed and vacant look in her eyes. Play with us, Falka. Nodbor, Sulik, you got it all wrong. Witchers aren't as dumb as you guys are. Falka picked up two sticks and crossed them before her chest like they were swords. She charged into the water, swinging her wooden sticks around, beating the drowners until they ran around howling in pain. The children were eventually drenched, and they went home, huffing and puffing. Falka was covered in sweat and stream water, but at least she looked a bit happier, and a silvery chuckle rang across the path. Sulik and Nadbor would turn around to steal a few glimpses of the girl. She was beautiful. Her skin was fair and glowed a healthy pink, and her eyes were radiantly emerald. The girl was still young, yet she had beauty far more exquisite than anyone could imagine. She was like a princess, someone leagues ahead of the country girls. The boys were at the age where they were interested in girls. The first time they saw Falka, they took a liking to her. They did everything they could and spent almost one month just to pull her out of the pit of sadness. It wasn't much, but at least she would smile sometimes now, and the boys would die for her smile. You sure know how to wield swords, Falka. Sulik looked a little embarrassed. Did you really practice with a witcher before? How'd you know they have two swords? The mention of witcher reminded the girl of a sad memory. Her face fell and she clasped her hands together. I've seen witchers and gone on adventures with them, killed a giant centipede in a forest too. It was a monster called Yearn. The brothers were agape. The kids then saw a circular fence slowly coming into view, and a woman in a yellow floral dress sat within the yard, washing clothes. The foam from the soap drenched her hair and sleeves, radiant sunshine raining down on her gentle, kindly face. And I rode on a griffin before. It's a beast bigger than a buffalo and more dangerous than a lion. Nodbor asked, Falka, I heard witchers would sometimes steal children. Are you one of those children who got taken? Falka nodded. With a sob, she berated herself. I should have left with them, but I ran away. That was stupid. I put myself in danger. Geralt said there was a connection between us, but he hasn't even shown up after so long. It's all right, Falka. Even without the witchers, I'll protect you. Sulik thumped his chest, his eyes filled with anticipation and trepidation. You'll be our sister now, but in time, you'll be, um, Yurga. The woman's surprised gasp snapped the children out of their conversation. 
Golden Cheeks staggered out of the yard and pounced at the carriage, crying. Yurga smiled at the witcher and leapt out of the carriage, walking toward the wife he had been longing to meet. I'm back, Golden Cheeks. I'm back! Yurga! Golden Cheeks was in the middle of doing the laundry, and she smelled like soap. She leaned into her husband's embrace, resting her head on his chest as she took in his warmth. After a prolonged period of separation, the couple moved around the yard together, refusing to be apart. Who is he? From the other side of the yard, Falca noticed the pudgy man that was coming toward them, and her heart skipped a beat. For some reason she was getting nervous, but the man looked friendly enough. Oh, that's father. Father's back. Quick, let's ask him for some presents. The boys took Falca and Da, rooted toward their father. Thank the gods you're back. I lost sleep just waiting for you. Here, touch my heart. It's almost jumping out of my chest. By the gods. Hold on, who are those people? They have swords, and the one on the left is really handsome. I'll tell you later, and don't fall for someone other than your husband. Where are the kids? I'd like to see them. How are they doing? They're doing great, at the riverside, but they should be back by now, all three of them. Three of them. The merchant looked horrified, like he was betrayed, and he was starting to imagine how his wife cheated on him. It's not what you think. A druid led a girl to our home. She lost her family because of the battle at Sodden, so I took her in. She's industrious, willing to feed the chickens and water the flowers. She's beautiful, too. Looks like a princess when she dresses up, but she's always so sad. Yurga, are you angry because I made this decision without asking? No, I, by the gods. Yurga smacked the back of his head and whirled around to look at the witchers. They heard the conversation and were coming over slowly, looking nervous and a bit excited. That's it. That's the thing I have but I do not know I possess. The third child. That's the unexpected child. And it's a girl, but now I have to give her away. Oh, why couldn't it be a boy? The merchant screamed in distress. Father! The boys jumped into Yurga's arms. You little rascals. Did you get fatter, Nadbor? Open your mouth, Sulik. Hmm, teeth are fine. Picky eater, aren't you? Your brothers double your size, at least. Yurga then looked kindly upon the girl in a drenched gray dress. Her eyes were the shade of lively green, and she had the looks of a doll. He gave her an encouraging smile. And what might your name be? I. Falka was starting to stammer. Her heart was racing, and she stared at the pair of witchers coming over. The man in the lead had white hair, a pair of swords, and eyes that spoke of a long history. He was the only thing she had her eyes on. The world itself seemed to disappear. The witcher and his unexpected child locked gazes. Geralt! Siri! Geralt gasped, and he darted to the child. Yurga and his family were dumbfounded. They had never seen someone move as fast as the wind, but Geralt showed them the impossible. The father and child bound by destiny finally met in the yard of a humble merchant. Geralt went down on his knees, and the girl wrapped her arms around his neck, her hair tumbling down his shoulder. Yurga mused, and he held his family in a tight embrace. Roy watched on with a smile. You're finally here, Geralt. Siri sobbed. I knew you'd find me. It's been months. They say grandfather and grandmother are dead. Suha's dead now, and Sintra's fallen. You're the only one left. And me, Roy added quietly, but he didn't pipe up. This is the law of surprise. Just like what you told me. I'm your destiny, aren't I? Just like how you're mine. We'll be together forever, won't we? Tell me. You're not just my destiny. Geralt whirled, looking at his smiling companion, then he looked at Yurga and his family, who were giving them encouraging looks. He then looked to the sky, where he could almost see a haughty woman with black, curly hair and a beauty mark at the corner of her lips. The whispers she told him during Bellatane so many years ago rang in his mind. Should a witcher and sorceress wish to build a long-term relationship, a granted wish by a jinn alone was not enough to guarantee success. They needed something else. An unexpected child was that something to tie the witcher and the sorceress together forever. Finally, Geralt looked at Ciri. She was that something they needed to tie their bond together. Time to go home. End of arc. Chapter 514, Yennefer. My dear friend, ever since our last meeting at Bellatane two years ago, I've never gotten any news of you. But in the aftermath of the Battle of Sodden, rumors are making the rounds. Rumors that the Northern Brotherhood has sustained heavy losses. 
Unable to hold my worry in, I have scoured the hill of the eight myself. When I saw that your name was not among one of the ones who died, I was overjoyed. Words alone aren't enough to paint a picture of my feelings. I can never forget about you, Yen. In my years of dull, uninteresting life, you're one of the rare sparks that make life worth living. Without you by my side, I find myself spacing out more times than I care to count. Your face keeps popping up in my head. I can never forget the smell of lilac and gooseberries. I can never forget the curls of your hair or the beauty mark right at the corner of your lips. One thing I wish to know is if you're fine. I have caught wind about your participation in the war. Are you hurt? If you are, is it bad? Do you need someone to take care of you? Say the word and I'll come to you. But my dear friend, if you're in the pink of health, then will you be gracious enough to meet me at my home? I have found the gift of destiny, as you mentioned, and took her home. Siri is her name, but now she goes by the alias of Falca. I do not know many sorcerers, and you're the one I trust the most. I trust that you can keep this a secret. Please, do come over and take a look at the gift destiny has given us. I eagerly await your arrival. Your friend, Geralt. Yennefer was sitting before her dressing table, and she closed the letter. She was in a black dress and a white shirt with lace sleeves and hem. The sorceress stared into the mirror, where a pale, sharp face looked back at her. Her violet eyes shimmered with a lure, and her lips curled with a smile. Geralt's not one to speak or express his emotions. He hides it well, only showing it very rarely, like tortoises peeking their heads out during sunny days. And even if he does speak, he does it in a very roundabout way. He never is this straightforward and daring. It's one step short of those three words at this point. I wonder who's the one who taught you how to write this letter, Gerald. Still, Yennefer was delighted by the letter. That headstrong witcher finally bowed his head, and he actually found his unexpected child like she suggested. I should grant him his little wish. And the girl's name is Siri, huh? She frowned. That's a name I'm very familiar with. The one name talked by the management of the Brotherhood and Kings of the Northern Kingdoms. Yennefer quickly dappled her lips with glistening lipstick and slid a pair of black gloves over her hands. She stood up and pointed her finger behind her, the light of magic shooting into the air. A bang rumbled the room, and a square portal appeared in the center of the resplendent bedchamber. Yennefer stepped into it. The carriage trundled through the muddy path behind Seven Cats Inn, stopping before a patch of alder woods. A pair of black heels hit the ground, and the petite sorceress sauntered down the path in the woods, her eyes glinting with curiosity. Despite being a path in the woods, it was covered with bluestone slabs, unlike the squalid paths most villages had. There were human-shaped signposts every few yards, pointing in the right direction so no one would get lost. Along the path, beautiful flowers bloomed in the wind, their scent filling the air with the beauty of life. The scenery was beautiful, and the short journey alone wasn't enough to soak in the entirety of it. Yennefer came to her destination and looked at the signboard that read, House of Gawain, and she couldn't believe what she was seeing. Is this really a witcher fortress? Shouldn't it be more desolate? The compound was circled by a fence, and a few wooden houses stood tall under the beaming sun. A mural of a blue sky and white clouds adorned the walls, and doodles of children holding hands in a dance stood under the sky. A black, wiener dog was happily darting around the yard, its flappy ears flapping about as it ran around, barking quietly. A pair of witchers she had never seen before were toiling in the fields, teaching three kids archery. The gray-haired Vesemir stood in a shack that looked like a smithy, swinging his hammer around, tempering the base of a chest armor. Sounds of recital came from the classroom, and the sight of students in the classroom almost made Yennefer think she came to an institution for nobility. There was a willow tree on the right side of the yard, and seven kids who were no older than ten years old were engaged in one-on-one -on -one swordplay training or dodging the spinning pendulum. These children were far more agile than kids their age. A terrible rumbling crashed overhead, and Yennefer tensed up as she witnessed Agra Fing charging out of the woods, spiraling overhead. It flapped its wings, stirring up a storm as it let out a happy roar. What is this place? Monsters roaming about in broad daylight? 
What are the witchers doing? An icy look took over the sorceress' face, and she held her obsidian pendant, ready to battle. Runes shimmered and covered her in a barrier. Might you be Lady Yennefer? Worry not, Griffon will not hurt you. A gaunt witcher in a cloak and leather armor approached her from the fields, late giving her a friendly smile. Welcome to the House of Gawain. I am Aucus of the Brotherhood. The witcher extended his arm. The sorceress daintily extended her fingertip and brushed his hand. At the same time, a hook-nosed, brooding witcher and the kids they were training set their sights on the sorceress. Where's Geralt? Yennefer was still tense. She noticed the griffin called Griffon making its landing, then the beast charged toward the training square beside the willow tree. The kids happily jumped at the beast, hugging and nuzzling it. Griffin looked more like a pet than an apex predator now. It growled a little as it carried the children on its back, resignedly running around the wooden stakes. Yennefer's lips twitched, but she held her magic back. She'd never seen any griffins this agreeable before. For a moment, she thought this was another beast in disguise. Geralt does not know of your arrival. He and the kids are out on a job. A job? The kids have passed their trial, so now they're learning how to fend for themselves. Pardon me for asking, but... Yennefer went into the conference room in the western building with Aukas. A bald, intimidating witcher and a man with a grotesque scar on his face nodded at her on the way. More witchers. What is this place? You have a big group of kids and a team of witchers running around, not just wolves either. I think I saw vipers. Yennefer noticed the viper pendant hanging around Aka's neck. She couldn't understand how witchers from different schools could get together. This was unheard of. Oh, did Geralt not explain this to you? Ah well, a letter alone isn't enough to paint the whole picture. The story of this establishment isn't exactly a simple one that can be told over the course of a single letter. Aukis shook his head. Think of it as a luxury orphanage. Kids who lost their parents and home can learn a trade and pick up the skill of reading and writing. The witchers are teachers here. The kids training under the tree look different from everyone else. They seem a bit too healthy. Ah, good eye, lady. Aukis said honestly. They've taken a dosage of potion that enhances their bodily functions. Our secret formula, so to speak, but they aren't quite at the stage where they can undergo proper mutations. Witchers don't strike me as the charitable kind, so why are you doing this? Yennefer looked into Aka's eyes, pursing her lips. I think you're building a secret academy just to raise new witchers. I take it you haven't noticed? The children in the classroom have not undergone any mutation or modification. Aukis pulled on the string of his cloak. We respect the children's choice, and we would never force them to go through the tea. Ryle, only a fraction of them would choose this path. You do not have to worry. Yennefer shook her head, but she held back her curiosity. So which one among them is Siri? asked Yennefer, a hint of nervousness lacing her voice. She's in the classroom learning. I'll take you to her. Siri was in a light blue blouse, her hair tied up in a ponytail. There was a smile on her lips, and she rested her chin in her hand. She looked at Keon and the children around her, who were listening to the teacher intently. It had been a month since she left Golden Cheek's house and joined the house of Gawain, but she'd fallen in love with this place. She had dozens of friends to play and learn with, and she was fed hearty meals every day. When she had time, she could play around with Ebony and Griffon too, or she would train with the boys. This was her dream life. Still, she wondered when she could go to Skellige to see Calanth. Ciri pursed her lips and turned to the left. She saw an unfamiliar but beautiful sorceress standing outside. She was petite, and her head was held high, giving her an arrogant look. There were a dozen kids in the classroom, but Yennefer set her sights on the girl with gray hair. She knew who Ciri was right away, as if they had a bond between them, an invisible but powerful bond. At the same time, she was filled with the desire to approach and protect the child. By recess, Siri was summoned to the conference hall alone. The girl blinked at the sorceress curiously, asking, Who is she, Aukis? Aukis looked out the window, where the children were playing with Ebony and the roosters. Geralt told you about her, Yennefer of Vengerberg. She's here to help you. I see. Siri drew out that sentence, her eyes sparkling mischievously. 
Yennefer blushed like the child had seen through her embarrassing past. Geralt told me. The girl darted toward Yennefer and held her hand. Clumsily, she lied. Geralt told me he's been missing you. He won't stop thinking about you all day. He calls out your name when he sleeps at night. Yennefer burst into laughter, breaking her cool, aloof facade, and she gently hit the girl's head. Siri held her head and blinked at the sorceress innocently. You sure know how to talk, but you can't lie to me. Dandelion can teach Geralt all the tricks he knows, but he still wouldn't be able to make Geralt say anything like that. Siri's lie was seen through, so she kept quiet. Yennefer turned to Akis. So what plans do you have for her? She's in a delicate position, so she now goes by the alias of Falca. The sorceress sized the girl up. Siri saw flickering flames, howling gales, rumbling earth, and roaring rivers in her eyes. She was a little scared of her gaze. And that's why we invited you. We need your input on this matter. Alcus patted the package on his jacket. The Brotherhood sorcerers have too many projects on their hands to deal with this matter. They do not have any time to teach her, so we turn to you. You have other sorcerers here. Lydda Nied, Triss Marigold, and Kalkstein. Triss, however, is not with us currently. Triss has been in contact with you people. Then surely my friend has seen Geralt, and she's kept it a secret all this time? Yennefer clicked her tongue in astonishment. And if I'm right, Coral has been absent from the Brotherhood for more than a year, and she didn't answer Viljefort's call for battle. I see she's been conducting experiments here. Akas wiped his forehead. Oh snap, perhaps I've told her more than what I should. You may question them when you get the chance. Lady Yennefer, do you know a lot of powerful magic? Are you stronger than Granny Lydda and Grandpa Kalkstein? Siri blurted. Akas buried his face in his hands. Am I hearing it right? Yennefer covered her mouth, chuckling. You called Lydda Granny? Who made you say that? Lambert did. Ah, that explains a lot. That man's tongue is going to be his downfall someday. And yes, I do know magic. The girl blushed and sheepishly asked, Then can you use ohm of that magic to turn me into a boy? What did you say? Yennefer shot the girl a sharp look. If I'm a boy, I can train my way up to be a witcher and train with Monty and the boys. Then I'll get to kill drowners in the future. That's a lot more fun than reading. Don't even think about it. Yennefer cut in sharply, her hair jumping around. Witcher mutations will do nothing but soil your power and bloodline. I can teach you something better. Alcus was displeased. How low does she think of us? How does becoming a witcher soil Ciri's talent? And then a commotion in the yard attracted Yennefer's attention. Five boys with steel swords and dirty leather armor came out of the woods and entered the yard. They were slender, and the muscles on their forearms were taut strong and brimming with power. The oldest of these boys was only thirteen. He looked lively and young, but there was an air of solemnity in his eyes not even adults had. Their eyes were amber, dark gold, and red in color. All had vertical pupils, much like the eyes of a beast. They had pendants hanging around their necks, but the patterns were different. Some were cats, some were wolves, some were griffins, and some were vipers. All glittered with the light of magic. They were like heroes who came back from the battlefield, victorious and triumphant. The kids who were in recess and those in training quickly huddled around the boys who came back, asking for gifts. And then they were passing around small trinkets like the fangs or claws of wild beasts and monsters. Even Ciri wanted to join in, but Akis held her by the nape. Sorry you had to see that. The lads just passed their trial. Can't manage more than searches for missing animals and a bit of drowner and necker hunting. Geralt went along just to make sure they stayed safe. The white wolf appeared from behind the children, looking deadpan. He scanned the boys who were bragging to the other children, then he turned to the left, and surprise filled his eyes. He saw the woman he'd been dreaming about for years, and he noticed the scent of lilac and gooseberries wafting in the air. Yennefer smiled at him. Yen, you made it. Still the same person I know. But you, my dear friend, have changed a lot, lost a bit of your wrinkles. You look younger, too. Perhaps it's because of your mingling with the children? She pulled her bangs back. No longer was her hair tucked in her golden snood. Instead, it tumbled down her shoulders, and her clothes were the usual black and white. An awkward look crept onto Gerald's face. 
and he cursed himself. Roy vehemently told him to address Yennefer as my dear, but Geralt, in all his obstinance, just had to add friend after that. That was the only part where Geralt pushed through with his opinion, and that came to bite him in the ass. Yennefer pursed her lips and pulled Ciri over. The girl stood between her and Geralt, then Ciri held Geralt's hand, forming a connection between them. Your letter brings me endless joy, so I came to return the favor of that joy, said Yennefer cryptically. You did the right thing. Ciri, I mean, Falca is in a delicate position. You need a trusted confidant to teach her, naturally. Ciri looked at Geralt and the sorceress. She had a feeling Yennefer had the advantage in the relationship, and Geralt felt like he was bowing to her. A cheeky smile curled the girl's lips as she came up with an idea to deal with Geralt if he tried to put her in a hard position. But first, tell me, what is it with this Witcher Brotherhood? To what ends does this organization serve? Long story. Patience is not in short supply. Chapter 515. Search. A dark, dank cave stood in the middle of nowhere. Bizarre stone formations lined the walls, jutting and protruding at weird angles. A puddle in the center of the cave's ground gleamed gray, a cloud of fog floating over it. Like a cat, Roy walked on his tiptoe, quietly skulking through the cave. Thanks to Cat, Roy's eyes were shining in the dark, and he saw ribbons of green intertwining and entangling among themselves in the air. At the end of the ribbon was a patch of bizarre flowers with diamond-shaped leaves and buds as big and bloody red as human hearts. They were also beating like live human hearts. Underneath the stalactite on the other side, an old stroller, tattered cloth, and a petite skeleton belonging to a baby slept. Leaves in dark caves, grows mutated plants, kidnaps babies. I know what you are now. Now that he knew what the monster was, Roy delved to the deepest part of the cave, where a dark chamber stood. A patch of yellowing vines covered the entrance, wriggling and writhing slowly like pythons. These plants were abnormally alive. A chilly gale whispered through the cracks between the vines, as if a beast were hiding behind the plants, whispering to the witcher. Roy cracked open a bottle of Thunderbolt and downed it. Black blood coursed through Roy's veins, creeping up his face, and his slow, quiet heartbeat started picking up pace. The young witcher quickly covered himself with two layers of magical barriers, one yellow, one black. Underneath him, a magical circle of different colors shone, and he injected mana into the rune sleeping in his mind. A purple ball leapt into existence, and then a beautiful maiden made of crimson flames stepped out of oblivion, hovering above the ground and spinning around. Snaps of fingers broke the silence of the cave, and streams of flames burst forth from the witcher and his minion, burning up the monstrous flowers hiding in the corner. The flowers shivered in the face of the fire, filling the air with weird sounds that resemble the scuttles of insects when they moved. In a moment, the flowers were burned to a crisp. When all eight flowers were burned, some contraption was triggered. The vines blocking the deepest chamber's entrance parted away and shrunk back into the crevices of the boulders. And then, a burly, humanoid creature emerged from the darkness. It resembled a leshen, its groin covered by a pair of yellowing, tattered boxers. The creature had a gray, slender torso and spindly limbs. Upon its body, green ferns and moss grew. Leshens had sticks jutting out everywhere on their bodies. But this creature had no antlers or bones on its skin. Its head and torso seemed like they were made out of flesh. Instead of a leshen, this creature looked more like a lanky old man with sharp claws and gnarly legs. Age 126 years old. Status, modified creature. This creature has undergone a modification process, granting it abilities that surpass regular Spriggans. HP, 300. Mana, 20. Strength, 25. Dexterity, 18. Constitution, 25. Perception, 16. Will, 16. Charisma, 18. Spirit, 20. Skills, Plant Whisperer, level 6. Costs a minor amount of mana. Grows a few plants. Range, anywhere the user can see. Vampiric vines, fast, resilient, and powerful vines, they can coil and kill the Spriggan's enemy, absorbing their blood and life force to nourish the user. Acidweed, a plant filled with corrosive liquid. Whenever an enemy appears, the weed will self-destruct, spraying the target with acid, burning through their armor, flesh, and bones. Venus flytrap, this plant sways and tears apart its target with its canine teeth, 
injecting paralyzing poison into its enemy's veins. Green Path Level 5 costs a minor amount of mana. The user can teleport to any nearby plant or location infested with seed. 20 second cooldown. Camouflage Level 7. The user can blend in with the plants around it whenever they are in the woods, hiding themselves from sight completely. Child of the Woods, passive, Spriggans are the guardians and chosen ones of nature. They are blessed for their protection of nature. Whenever Spriggans are in the woods, their recovery of stamina, mana, and wounds are doubled. Modification, passive. This Spriggan has undergone an unnatural modification. It possesses an abnormally great life force and recovery ability, plus 10 to constitution, plus 50 to HP. In exchange for these increased stats, this Spriggan is filled with bloodlust and aggression. The Spriggan had an almost comically big nose, but the dark eyes hiding behind its unkempt hair were filled with violence and malice. Roy fired up Gabriel's enchantment and marked the Spriggan with a gemstone mark. As another bolt flew through the air, the Witcher and his minions' fireballs hurtled toward the Spriggan. The creature quickly turned into a mirage and shrank into a black atom, then it disappeared. Without any target to hit, the bolt and fireballs slammed into the cave's walls. Debris rained to the ground, and sparks flew. The creature reappeared nearby and raised its arm. As it swung its arm, a curtain of magical light shimmered in the air, and a wave of earth element surged within the cave. The witcher's medallion buzzed violently, and alarm bells rang in his head. Roy leapt to the side, and a gust of wind grazed him. When he stood back up and had a closer look, the spot he previously stood on was taken over by a patch of vines that broke through the ground. The vines were nearly ten feet long, and their tips were sharp as blades. Thorns adorned the vines from tip to base. If Roy was hit by those, his flesh would be torn off. These vines charged straight from the ground. If Roy hadn't escaped fast enough, he would have been speared. The Atronach wasn't as agile as her master, and the vines needled her body. The flames around her dimmed until they were barely sparks, and the Atronach was nearly see-through. Roy gathered up his strength and swung his blade down, cutting the vines into two. He then made a sign and let out a roar, filling the air with the element of water as Clamp was cast, buffed by the power of wing flap. His clone leapt out of the void and took Gabriel, then it fired away at the Spriggan, standing at the corner twenty yards away. Despite its life coming to an end for now, the Atronach didn't stop tossing fireballs at the enemy. Once again, the ground rumbled, and a row of vines broke through the ground, forming a wall before the Spriggan, an impenetrable wall that kept the bolts and fireballs away from their master. The creature stood behind the wall, casting its spells without a care in the world. With Erendite in his hands, Roy charged straight at the monster, puddles splashing across the ground. A gigantic Venus flytrap rose before him, swaying in the darkness. The monstrous plant opened its maw, revealing rows of sharp incisors within. Sickly green drool trickled down the cracks between its incisors, corroding the ground. And then it lunged at the Witcher. A flash of light flew across the air and a spurt of verdant blood shot into the air. The Witcher quietly stepped past the Venus flytrap, the plant's stalk and its bud falling down with a thud behind him. A roar escaped the Spriggan's mouth, and a row of terrifying plants rose into the air. Yet the Witcher did not stop. He crouched and charged ahead, swinging his sword again and again and again, crimson arcs of light shimmering across the battlefield. The young Witcher wasted no time in cutting the plants in two, but his shield was broken in the process of the battle. Roy stopped for a moment and cast another sign, but something unexpected happened. A big patch of cabbage-like plants burrowed out of the ground and ballooned in size, stopping Roy from getting any closer to the wall of vines. Roy grabbed the ground underneath with his toes and leapt ahead like a tiger, pouncing at its prey. The young witcher jumped high up into the air and arced across the battlefield like a dancer. Dull bangs thundered across the patch of plants underneath as though they exploded, spraying green liquid everywhere. E-Liquid ate through Roy's quen and made his boots sizzle. The Atronach and Clone let out a howl before they disappeared into shards of light as the acid hit them. Roy finally made his landing, standing right ahead of the Wall of Vines. He stared at it, and the Spriggan too returned the Witcher's stare, 
but its eyes were devoid of emotion. Roy swung his blade horizontally, a crimson flash cutting through the vines. The resilient plants were torn apart, but the blade's attack did not stop. The Spriggan, however, had teleported to the other side of the cave. Roy fired a bolt and teleported to the monster right away, slamming down to the ground like a meteor crashing into the earth. His sword was raised high up in the air, and he brought it down at the creature without mercy. The blade sliced through the Spriggan's grotesque face, gouging out its flesh and leaving a deep gash. Green blood spurted from the wound, but the injury was already starting to heal. The Spriggan howled, swinging its lethal claws around. So fast it swung, the monster left after images. It slammed its claws against the ground, leaving craters in its wake, but the Witcher didn't defend himself. He moved out of the monster's attacks, slowing it down with Yurden. Without much difficulty, Roy escaped the monster's attacks, all three of them. When the Spriggan raised its claws for the fourth time, its arms froze, and something pulled it off the ground. Crimson tentacles wriggled out of the void, coiling and constricting it in a cocoon as it raised the Spriggan high up into the air before presenting it to the Witcher like a present. Silence reigned for three seconds, the only sound a sickening squelch as Arendite was plunged into the eyeball of the creature. Roy slammed the edge into the creature's face, bursting its eyeball in a spectacular show that gained him a splash of green blood and white, gooey brains. Quen deflected the liquid, and it slowly slid to the ground. Again and again the witcher stabbed, until the crack of a bone rang out clearly through the air, and the stabbing stopped. Roy pierced his blade through the skull, charged through its brain, broke through the back of its skull, and peeked through the back of the monster's head. The young witcher let go of the hilt and heaved a sigh of relief. The blade pinned the monster on the wall behind it like it was some fish ready to be grilled. Spriggan, modified, killed. EXP plus 300, level 12 witcher, 111 to 100, slash 2500. The monster's corpse quickly shattered into motes of green light and melded with the air, leaving the skull, the claws, and a greater blue mutagen that was brimming with mana behind. Roy quickly tucked them into his inventory, and he wiped his blade clean. The lesion was stronger. A moment of rest later, the young witcher went around the mess and entered the abode of the dead Spriggan. On his way into the abode, he lit up the brazier, and the light from the flames shone upon a small but fully decked-out lab. Vials and jars and vessels commonly seen in laboratories lined this chamber. The most prominent aspect was the cage in the center of the lab. It was made of alloy with dimericium mixed in it, and something tore a hole in it. Not far from the hole were the remains of a blonde adult man with dried hair. The cadaver sat with its back leaning against the wall. The blue robe it wore was torn and filled with holes, chaos energy lingering around its bones, an obvious sign that the corpse was a sorcerer when it was still alive. Algernon, an expert in genetic modification, dead for at least two and a half years. Roy scoured the lab and found a diary with its black cover covered in soil sitting near the corpse. Most scholars loved to jot down the details of their experiments. May 1258 I, Freckled Axel, Gorazd, Cruel Ortolan, and Aidaran reconvened for an exchange. All experts in the field of genetic modification, of course, and it was a wonderful conversation between geniuses. The brainstorming brought with it countless inspirations. In the end, we came up with a string, ent genetic modification process. The subject? The Leshen subspecies I caught, a Spriggan. I cannot wait to see the results of this plan. We shall be creating a new species of creature. March 1259. After copious amounts of experimentation, we have found something. Spriggans are more plants than they are animals. Their body contains the chlorophyll necessary for photosynthesis, but they can also hunt for sustenance like all beasts do. I plan to weaken the plant side of this Spriggan and stir up more of its animal side. August 1260. My experiment is almost done. I have created a brand new kind of Spriggan. I cannot wait to contact my colleagues so they can witness my work. They will be surprised, I'm sure. Still, I am concerned. The cage seems unable to stop the Spriggan's increased strength. I'll have to reinforce it. September 1260, some of the words were covered by blood. So this is how it feels to be absorbed by a Spriggan. 
Unlike Leshens, who absorb the life force of their believers slowly from a range, this Spriggan utilizes vines to suck out blood and mana. More words were covered by blood. At the same time it absorbs my strength, the Spriggan injects a paralyzing toxin into my body, numbing the pain and killing my resistance. I even feel a sense of delight. Alas, I cannot use even an ounce of my magic. The blood-sucking vines coil around me like a cocoon. The creature only allows freedom in one hand, and so with this hand I shall write the last entry of my life. To die at the hands of their creation is bliss for a scholar, Algernon. Hmm, the journal ended there. Apparently, Algernon's reinforcement of the cage went awry, and he was killed by his own creation. There was also a lot of experiment data in the journal. Roy tossed the book into his inventory space, and took quite some time to dismantle the Dimerisham cage. He then took the parts away as well. Dimerisham was worth a lot, after all. Once he was done looting, Roy whipped out a diamond-shaped crystal and rubbed it thrice. The light of magic blinked, and a diamond-shaped screen was projected in the air. A moment later, a beautiful sorceress appeared, nervously pulling her bangs away, strands of hair tickling her nose. She looked adorable. I found Algernon near the address you gave me, Triss. Well, what's left of him anyway? Killed by his own creation. A feral spriggan. Nothing more than a skeleton now, and he's been dead for more than two and a half years. Triss gasped and huddled closer, her eyes filled with worry as she looked at the Witcher. Are you hurt, Roy? Did the creature injure you? Thanks for your concern. Roy smiled brightly at her and flexed his biceps. But do I look hurt? That monster wasn't even enough for a warm-up. Triss held her hands together before her belly and gave Roy an adorable smile. Almost dazzled, Roy quickly said, Oh, found some names in his journal, too. Axel, Gorazd, and Grandmaster Ordolan. Ah, I was just going to tell you that. Triss stared into Roy's eyes. According to my investigation, those people are experts in the field of genetic modification, Ordolan especially. He's one of the assistants of Alzur back in Risberg when the experiment was going on. Gorazd Axel, Ordolan, and the missing Eidoron are fanatics of the field of genetic modification, and they are close friends. They would periodically hold conversations about that matter. However, two of the quartet have died in the Battle of Sodden Hill, their names engraved on the obelisk. It has been years since Grandmaster Ordolan showed himself in the Brotherhood, Rumors say that he is conducting the experiment of a lifetime. Another genetic modification, perhaps? Roy mused. That's the only lead I have left that can lead me to Idaran. Ivar, Erland, Arnagad, and Elgar are proving to be too elusive. Auka's team failed to find anything that could lead us to them. I've asked Tasaya, and she's given me an address. It's a house Ordolan used to live in. That house is in Hindarsfjall of Skellig Isles. You can take a look when you have time. That it's really helpful, thank you. Roy stared into her eyes and said, Once I figure out this whole mess and deal with it, I'll be certain to thank you personally. The witcher's gaze was a bit too aggressive, and Triss blushed. She stared at the ground and smiled. With her best effort, she tried to stay relaxed, and she said, It's all right, Roy. I owe you my life. Twice. If you need my help, just say the word. But this is the most I can do for now. If I go any deeper... It's going to backfire and gain some unwanted attention. Then you should stop for now, Triss, Roy said. Come back when you have time. See the kids. Sure. Reminiscence filled Triss's eyes, and she looked a lot more at ease. But I have a lot of royal duties to deal with. Within two months, the North and Nilfgaard will be signing a ceasefire. Vilgforts will be spearheading the effort. Roy's pupils contracted. Vilgforts. Like the original timeline, he has gained fame after the battle and climbed up the hierarchy in the Brotherhood. He's a formidable enemy indeed. Ciri's under our protection, so Vilgeforts can't lay a finger on her. Roy wanted to find the Grandmasters first, or he would never rest easy. He was surprised that the North and South were going to sign a ceasefire. Northerners all thought Calanthe and Iced had died in the Battle of Sintra, but not too long ago, Roy had just ascertained that Calantha was alive and pregnant in Skellige Isles, so why didn't she stand up and rally the Sintrans? Oh, Kira's calling me. I have to go now. Triss smiled and twirled her hair, her eyes glistening with delight. Stay in touch. Yeah. The screen dimmed.
Roy sorted out the lab and teleported himself back to the underground lab in rural Toussaint. He picked up Guire and shared Griffin's vision. The young witcher saw a white-haired witcher and a beautiful raven-haired sorceress having a talk in the conference hall, and he smiled. He gave Griffin an order, and the beast shook off the pestering whippersnappers, then it craned its head closer to the conference hall's window sill, keeping its eyes wide and ears pricked up, ready to gain intel for its master. Chapter 516 The Plan for Siri Unbelievable For a hundred years the Witcher schools have been in constant decline, yet now you band together for a young man. Seventeen Witchers, two sorcerers, and a member of the Skellige Isles Circle of Druids. This is a formidable force, one that is to be reckoned with, and you are still getting stronger with the influx of new witchers. Yennefer was impressed by the story Geralt told her. Roy is a visionary. His eye for the future is something you fossils will never learn. So where is he? Siri looked at Geralt too. Ever since she left Golden Cheek's home, she hadn't seen Roy, and she missed him. Only when he was around could she ride on Griffon without any worries. Roy has a lot to do, Aukas answered, before Geralt could, holding his shoulder down. He didn't want Geralt to tell everything to this stranger, just because she was his lover. The fewer people who knew about the Grandmasters, the better. His presence here would put us at risk, and please do not talk about his name when you're out and about. I promise, but when the time is right, Yennefer shook her head. What a shame. She was curious about the Brotherhood, but she was new here, so she should stop before she went too far. Now let's get back to business. Yennefer patted Ciri's head and snapped her fingers. The witcher's medallions buzzed, and a gust of wind closed the curtains, keeping prying eyes from seeing in and making sure no sound went out. Roy frowned, and the griffin that was hiding under the windowsill charged into the conference hall. Once it squeezed into the room, the beast swiped its tail and shut the wooden door. It then raised its furry head at the sorceress, the look in its eyes saying, All right, you have your peace and quiet now. Continue. Griffon, here, let me hug you. Siri happily leapt onto the griffin's back and nuzzled herself against its mane. She narrowed her eyes and took a deep breath. Ignore them. Geralt massaged his temples. Continue. How did you find Siri, Geralt? Rumors have it that the princess of Sintra has died during her escape from her fallen nation. Yennefer gave the griffin a look. From what I know, all the northern kingdoms are sending their intelligence teams out to find her. The kings wish to gain the princess so they can gain the support of Sintra's people and enrich themselves with the wealth of the nation that Nilfgaard has toppled. And Nilfgaard wants to get their hands on the girl as well. They need a member of the royal family who's malleable so they can rightfully take over Sintra's rulership. Menno Kohorn, Sintra's current governor, is agonizing over this matter. Yennefer continued. Visigurd, who survived the war, is taking in the refugees with the support of the King of Brugg. He's gathering an army to reclaim their lost home, and they too are searching for Ciri. The princess's smile disappeared, and she felt trepidation setting in her heart. Quietly, she leaned against Griffin, feeling its warmth and heartbeat. I know, Yen. Even without those people, there are already two men out there searching for her. A knight from Nilfgaard and a sorcerer who looks like a mercenary. But what of it? Destiny still led me to the girl. Geralt looked at the princess, his face softening up. Ever since he found Ciri, he had decided to never let go of her. Relenting would only invite an even harsher punishment from destiny, but it would only fall on the girl. My brothers and I shall protect her. She can grow without worries under our wing. So that means you're not going to hand her over to anyone? Yennefer had a look that said, I knew it. Yennefer looked at the girl on the griffin's back, and pity filled her face. So what's the plan? Will you raise her like she's a regular human so she can live her life in peace? Or will you turn her into a witcher like the children? Will you let her take the ridiculous potion made up of proprietary decoctions, special fungus, and shrooms? What then? She'll undergo that deadly trial and go through hell for a measly che, ants at survival. Only three out of ten manage to become witchers, as I'm sure you know. I, I want to be a witcher, shouted Ciri. She leapt down from the griffin and quickly approached Geralt. The girl held his hand and swayed his arm, pleading, 
I want to be a swordsperson like Geralt, a monster hunter. You foolish girl. Yennefer narrowed her eyes and held Ciri's other hand, pulling her closer. You do not know what this means at all. You are still young, and you require proper guidance to train your powers. Taking potions and decoctions to gain strength is not the best way to go about this. Shocked by Yennefer's imperious command, the girl took a few steps back until she could barely smell the lilac and gooseberries coming off her. Geralt fell into a dilemma. After a discussion with the Brotherhood, he did consider having Ciri undergo witcher training and become the first girl to go through the mutation. The dangers awaiting her were many and lethal. She must have enough strength to protect herself, but they hadn't started preparations yet. There's nothing wrong with the potions. After Lita and Kalkstein's modifications, the trial is perfectly safe now. Aukus crossed his arms, puffing his chest out. He was a little displeased, and he looked at Yennefer quizzically. You seem to have a deep-set prejudice against witchers. I am just stating the facts. Yennefer smiled arrogantly and held the edges of Ciri's cheeks gently. Open your mouth and say, ah! The sorceress checked Ciri's teeth like she was a horse. Ciri quickly shook her head free of the sorceress and harumphed, trying to bite her hand. Yennefer grabbed the girl's cheeks and pulled on them like they were balls of dough. She's just ten, barely starting to grow. Your potions will affect her body's growth, akin to forcing a chick to grow into a chicken in mere weeks. Yes, she will grow faster, but at the expense of her potential, just like you, Geralt. Yennefer looked at her long-lost lover and sighed. You used to be a source, but that mutation back when you were a child destroyed your potential. Witcher potions will scramble her hormones and fry her endocrine system. Heavy physical and swordsmanship training will also change the composition of her body and muscles. It'll also take away her feminine physical traits. Ciri will grow up hating you for this, do you understand? She has a point. Aukus stole a glance at Yennefer's generous bosom, then he looked at Ciri. The Witcher imagined a woman with a cute face, but paired with an overly muscular body with pecs instead of a soft chest. He shivered. She thinks a lot further than we do. It's still not too late. Ciri's as healthy as she can be, said Geralt, looking at Yennefer. Any suggestions? Appropriate training. Yennefer raised her chin and circled Ciri, sizing her up like she was merchandise. The girl shivered in fear. She had to convince herself that Yennefer meant her no harm general classes, and some self-defense classes. It's a tough world out there. These training sessions will come in handy should she find herself in sticky situations. You're not her nannies. You cannot keep an eye on her at all times. We were already planning on doing that, Geralt nodded. Oh, so I can jump around the stakes and have the juice the boys are taking? Siri jumped around, happy as a rabbit, her eyes glinting with anticipation. Oh, those concoctions are no simple drinks. They're special medicines made to strengthen the body, bitter as a gourd. A bloodthirsty smile curled Akka's lips. And you're going to beg us to stop training you eventually, Siri. Siri curled her spindly forearms. Don't underestimate me. I've fought the crybaby, tilled the fields, and reared chickens. I'm not as weak as you think. Yennefer held Siri's shoulder tightly. She couldn't imagine the pampered princess going through the kind of hell a child like her shouldn't. Two, she can't just stay here forever. This is a good place to raise children into decent human beings, yes, but Ciri's in a delicate position. N, she can't stay in one place for long, or the intelligence teams will find out where she is. You, Geralt, have to be careful. There are people out there who know of your connection with Ciri. They might get to her through you. Yennefer said coldly, you need to show her the wider world sometimes. Show her what this world has to offer, and make sure to stay out of trouble. Ciri held Yennefer's hand tightly and looked at her with worship and gratitude. I'm sorry for doubting you, Lady Yennefer. So you do know my wish. Thank you for telling Geralt to take me on adventures. I will, but only after the war has ended. The paths will be less dangerous then. Roy told him the same thing before, so Geralt hadn't left Novigrad lately. Still, it was time to contact their allies and set up some defenses against the spies. We'll be going sightseeing, the Temple of Melitele in Elander, for example. But first, we'll be taking her to Skellige Isles. There's someone she must see. 
Siri clasped her hands to her mouth, delight flaring in her eyes. We're finally going to see Calanth? She didn't say that out loud, however. Geralt had told her to never leak the secret that her grandmother was still alive. Why Skellige? Yennefer asked. Geralt said nothing. Displeasure flashed in Yennefer's eyes, and she raised her head, but she didn't press further. Three, and this is the most important point. Solemnity painted Yennefer's face. You might have missed this, but I didn't. As a sorceress, from the moment I touched Ciri, I knew what kind of existence she must be. What is she? Geralt asked. A source. Impossible. Geralt shook his head. The medallion didn't react to her, nor did she display any magic. Because she does not know of her potential, let alone use it, her talent has been dormant all this time, never showing itself. Yet that does not change the fact that her latent potential has been slowly and safely mingling with the chaos energy around her. Her talent for magic might be one of its kind. Surely you still remember who her mother was, what her mother was. Geralt fell silent as he was reminded of an event that happened ten years ago. During the ball Calanthe held to pick a potential partner for Pavetta, the late princess hovered in the air and let out a scream, her magic knocking everything over in the whole ballroom. Siri inherited her mother's talent for magic? I wonder if that's a blessing or a curse. Lady Yennefer. Aka's gaze took on a hostile hue. You aren't taking the girl to Aretuza, are you? Your worries are unfounded. Yennefer frowned and combed Ciri's hair with her fingers. The sorcerers have long since stopped scouring for sources and children with a proclivity for magic. They have long since stopped snatching children away from their parents. The people who are smart enough will enroll their magically talented children to our academy. I will not take Ciri away from you, and I will keep everything a secret. Yennefer looked solemn, and she spoke softly but firmly. That I can promise you, Geralt. I've never doubted you, Yen. Geralt finally had a chance to show his feelings for her. In case our little source's magic goes out of control and hurts the other kids, I'll be staying around to guide her. Yennefer finally set her goal, until she masters the rudimentary control over magic. Lady Yennefer, can I use magic to fly in the sky like Griffon? Ciri's eyes shone. No, at most you can hover a few feet off the ground. A sorceress needs at least decades of training. At most, you can learn a trick or two over the course of your training, and that's only when you work for it. But if you keep it up, someday you will be an illustrious sorceress yourself. A pause later, a hint of respect flashed in Yennefer's eyes. Just like Vilgerfort's. I promise, Ciri looked ecstatic. In her naive mind, sword and sorcery were interesting games. Geralt nodded and looked at the dazzling sorceress. We'll be arranging a magic class for Ciri, on top of her general class and physical education. But will too, his get in the way of your work. So what if it does? Will you compensate me in any way? Yennefer gave the white wolf a look, her lips glistening lustrously, inviting the witcher to come closer. Geralt looked away. My only job is to educate Ciri. If you don't mind, how about I start her first session right now? Yennefer looked at the witchers and held Ciri's hand. You can introduce the other members and the kids to me at dinner. Roy was done watching the exchange. He cut off the vision and descended the staircase that led into a brightly lit lab. A curvaceous sorceress in a black dress stood before the arcane enchanter, colorful chaos energy swirling around her fingers, runes covering a perfectly shining plate armor in the center of the table. That was the plate armor Irulan made for Roy back in Skyrim the one birthed by the Skyforge and came with 40% fire resistance. Ah, just in time. Noticing Roy's presence, Lydda motioned at him to come closer. Try your new armor on. I changed the enchantment into Halo of Flames. It'll cover you with a layer of an invisible barrier of flames once activated. Anyone who gets close to you will be damaged over time. You, of course, are exempt from this effect. Whenever the effect is not in use, the armor will absorb the chaos energy lingering in the air. Once fully charged, the armor can last for half an hour. That is outstanding enough, Coral. Roy took off his leather armor, and Lydda straightened out his collar for him. Evelyn has replanted thirty types of Skyrim herbs, but she'll need to grow them for a year or two before they can be used in any concoction. Coral straightened out his sleeves and collar as she gently told him what the Brotherhood's members were doing. 
Letho and Keon have made modifications to Thunderbolt using the herbs you brought back. That's the first decoction they worked on. Its effect is now raised by 20%. Vesemir has almost figured out the process behind the making of this set of armor, but we do not have the skills to recreate it, let alone turn the dragon scales and bones into anything usable. We are in dire need of a master armorsmith. Time to seek out Berengar, I guess. Noticing the look on Roy's face, Coral said, While you and Geralt were searching for Ciri, Vesemir had taken off to Vizima to search for Berengar. But the lone wolf is still traveling across the continent. He will not return for a year or two. Roy rubbed his chin and tried his best to come up with the names of any possible swordsmith and armorer. Since the timeline wasn't there yet, he had no idea where Hattori, Novigrad's famed elven blacksmith, and Ioana, the blacksmith of Valen, could be found. The only place he knew that housed master armorers was the Skellige Isles. On the Isle of Undvik, a clan by the name of Tortorok stood tall. They had the most talented blacksmiths and the best forges on their side. Just as well, Roy was traveling to Skellige soon to investigate Ortolan and find a lead on Eideron. He could deal with two matters at the same time, so he told Coral about his plan. Vizena had news for us. Suspected sightings of the red light in the Druid Circle in Mayenna and the one near Sodden. The culprit is still unknown. Roy nodded. The cleansing light was not a threat to them just yet, so he was not worried. Ah, almost forgot. Yennefer has arrived at the orphanage. You can talk to her when you see fit. Oh, the raven-haired woman from Vengerberg. Lida's eyes glinted. You know her? Acquaintances, I'd wager, but she's an arrogant woman. Hard to approach. Lida brushed a finger across Roy's cheek. Heard it's because of her modification. Went too far into the deep end and modified her personality. First me, then Triss, and now Yennefer. Lida took on a quizzical tone, her eyes fixed on Roy. What are you thinking, dragging us all into your brotherhood? We know each other. Don't take this the wrong way. Roy shook his head quickly. Yennefer and Geralt had some entanglements between them to settle, so, so I lent thee, Emma Hand. Coral bought the story, though only just. Now that the Battle of Sodden Hill is over, can I go back to the brotherhood and our Atuza? That shocked Roy. Why are you going back? The Witcher was a little uneasy about her departure. I didn't sell myself to the Brotherhood. Even witchers get to enjoy a hot bath and good wine during their downtime. Sorcerers get to take a little break to enjoy the success of, of their experiments, don't you think? Rue couldn't argue with that. Don't worry, I'm just going to see some old friends, then I'll be back. They're all ladies. Coral rested her head on Roy's shoulder. Roy looked at her soft, flawless face. Don't get into any of the organization's plans. Don't jump into anything political, and stay away from Tessaya. She's a stubborn one. Same goes for Philippa Eilhart and everyone in the Brotherhood, especially Viljeforts and the Daisy of the Valleys. By that you mean Lady Francesca Findebert? Yes, she's a gorgeous woman, as I'm sure you know, but she's hiding a big secret underneath her beauty. You'd best stay far, far away from her. Scoyatel should show themselves soon. I'll explain next time. Chapter 517 Skellige Isles. A silver line extended across the horizon, heralding the coming of dawn. A cloaked silhouette leapt out of the world gate, appearing within the bedchambers of Bran, ruler of Skellige. Roy looked at the bed. A plump Kalanth was sound asleep, and the Witcher made his way to the windowsill. He fired a bolt into the air and reappeared right beside the bed. As Roy reached his destination, he let off another bolt, this time hurtling toward the top of the building. The Witcher disappeared and reappeared beside the second bolt, landing on the roof, and he stared into the distance. What greeted him were the six Isles of Skellige. On the west coast was the lush island of Spikerug, its fang-like outline and cliff standing tall against the waves, the top of its mount hidden behind the blanket of clouds. In the south was Ard Skellig. The southern part of Ard Skellig was made of even land, while its northern part was a deep fjord. The conical island of Hindarsfjall sat in the southeast. According to the clue Triss gave him, that was where Ordolan was residing. Standing behind Ard Skellig was a lone island by the name of Faro, isolated from the other isles. It looked like the exposed back of a whale. In the west was the Isle of Undvik, the other destination Roy wanted to visit. It was home to Clan Tortorok. 
Roy peered further beyond and saw seagulls, cormorants, and swallows congregating on the cliffs. This is going to be a big undertaking, so I should start with the simple tasks. The young witcher fired a bolt and disappeared from the roof, reappearing on ground level a moment later. He couldn't teleport right away to Undvik, so he needed a boat to ferry him across the strait. He could use Arendite's power and walk on water, but Roy wanted to ride a boat. Sailing on a boat alone while watching the endless seas churning and crashing was an interesting thing to do, and he could farm a bit of EXP while he was at it. Through a path between the serene woods Roy traversed, the young witcher made his way toward Uriala Harbor, a place located in the southern part of Anskellig. The isles were located far, far away from the main continent, greenery covering almost every single place. Colorful flowers blossomed in full bloom everywhere, accompanied by a great stretch of bushes and woods that were home to centuries-old oak and pine trees. There was the occasional house tucked between the woods, bizarre fishes laid out on the wooden rack in the house's yard to dry. The islanders' skin was red and tough, courtesy of their constant exposure to the sea breeze. Most draped themselves with the skin of seals. All of them had some form of weaponry tucked at their buckles. These people would not shy away from a fight. The witcher noticed an abundance of a certain goddess's statue standing around the aisle. The statue of Freya. Ladies of all ages, even pregnant ones, would stand before the statues. They wore oversized robes, standing straight up. Roy couldn't see much of their faces. The ladies would bow their heads and put their hands before their chests in a prayer. The young witcher also noticed that they were wearing a necklace around their necks. A stone vat sat on the altar before the statues. Around it were smaller statues, statues of animals sacred to Freya, cats and eagles. Like how most people in the northern part of the continent worshipped Melitele, the people of the isles and kingdoms neighboring the sea mostly put their faith in the goddess, Freya. The goddess was the patron saint of fertility, romance, beauty, and harvest. She was the guardian spirit of oracles, fortune tellers, and spirit mediums. The continent's people thought Freya and Melitella were one and the same, but that statement was sacrilege in the eyes of the islanders. Roy suspected that Freya might be blessing him, since he wasn't attacked by any of the local monsters. He thought he'd run into armored arakas, werewolves, or even harpies, but no. He didn't even run into any bandits. The Witcher arrived at the harbor without so much as a scratch. His first thought about the harbor? It was rundown a far cry from the bustling port of Novigrad. There were only a dozen regular houses, inns, smithies, and warehouses dotting the wooden port. The buildings looked rugged and had no intricate patterns adorning their walls. These structures were built with practicality in mind. Like its people, aesthetics weren't something they cared about. A few ships were docked at the harbor. Some of them were drakkers, ships made for the military. The bronze shields that hung by their sides shimmered under the sun. There were also barges used to carry shipment. Those were employed by merchants who came all the way to Skellige Isles for trade. Guards with horned helms and brigandine armor patrolled around the ships, peering sharply at the people walking around, and they paid special attention to Roy, who was covered in a black cloak. The guards kept an eye on him until he went into the cane toad, a circle of old, rectangular tables surrounded a big bonfire in the center of the tavern. Patrons sat around the tables, drinking and feasting away. This place reminded him of the inn back in Skyrim, but unlike Skyrim, there were no bards around, playing decadent tunes with the lute. The islanders did not take particular interest in poetry, thought they took a long time to get to the point. They were far more interested in boxing matches. A mandrake cordial, please. Roy sat before the counter and whipped out ten coppers. Skellige Isles had a trade route that led to Novigrad, so they accepted crowns here. The cheapest alcohol around these parts would be mandrake cordial and cherry cider. The bartender with a bush of gray mustache tucked the coins into his apron and filled a mug to the brim with mandrake cordial for Roy. The islanders loved their alcohol, partly because it could help with the biting winds from the seas. Thanks to that, they had bigger mugs than most places, and they didn't cost more either. First time Aaron Skellige? You gotta try our famous pickled auk. Tis succulent. The bartender grinned. 
Roy shivered and shook his head. Then he slammed five coppers onto the counter. Got a question for you. Heard there's a clan called Tordorok on Unvik. Everyone's a blacksmith there, correct? Some of them master blacksmiths too, right? Capable of making great weapons and armor? Aye. Tis as ye say, Clan Tordorok has the best blacksmiths and forge and skellige, nay, the whole world. The bartender's eyes gleamed, his mustache swaying. Proudly, he proclaimed, they made the sword his majesty uses. Ter be honest with ye, everyone in Skellige would love ter have a weapon made by one um. Ain't all sunshine and roses with em, though. Numbers been dwindling lately, and ain't so are the good blacksmiths. Limited production eerie year, so they cost a fortune, and ye can't buy them just cause ye got coin. Ye have to be privileged, too. Only those who pass their test can purchase one of them gear. The bartender smiled mysteriously. If you're interested, ye best be prepared. Huh, that's odd. Didn't know they had that kind of system in this world. Roy nodded and downed the tart cordial. Then he grinned. What about the ships? Need to board one to get to Unvik. Aye, bad timing, lad. The bartender cleaned a mug, looking downcast. Tourism only gets a boost in them summer days, about five ships taking them tourists round the aisles every day. Off-season now, though, so ship only comes once in three days, and it just left yesterday. Cherry cider, please. Can I rent a boat, then? Just by myself. Laddie, that ain't worth it, to be honest. The bartender looked at the young witcher, ain't looking like them rich kids. You're gotta spend at least a hundred crowns. Ah, it's not what you think. I won't be using anything big. Roy held up his right thumb and index finger, and he smiled. Just a fishing boat for one, and an oar. The bartender froze, and he warned solemnly, You're not joking, are ye? Tis a long way away from Unvik. Even Drakkar's gotta take a whole day, and night just to get to Unvik from the port. You gotta brace for undercurrents, reefs, and thunderstorms on your way. But that's not all. Echidnas. An army o em on the sea. Ear seen those monsters? The bartender animatedly described, they have fish-like tails and scales, evil wings like them bats, maws filled with incisors, and claws so sharp they can tear leather apart like they're nothing. They can fly and travel underwater. Loves attacking boats that travel by. Ain't picky about their food, that's for sure. Fish and freshly decaying human flesh? Feast for them. Ye try sailing alone to Unvik, and I guarantee ye that the Echidna's gonna swoop down on ye and gobble ye up, for ye can even make it one-third of the wa. The bartender stopped talking as Roy took his sunglasses down and revealed a pair of multicolored eyes. His gaze was sharp and almost blindingly bright, like gold and silver shimmering under the sun. It was almost terrifying. Should they come for me, then they best be prepared to die, just as well that I need them for some decoctions. A golden sun hung high in the blue, blue skies, its rays piercing through the thin blanket of fog swaying on the surface of the seas, the silhouette of a long wooden boat slowly emerging from the mist. The vessel was alone on the vast sea, small and seemingly weak against nature. The witcher sat in the center of the boat, his back straight, and he pulled his oar back with all his might. The wooden oar swept through the water, pushing Roy away from An Skellig, slowly driving him toward Unvik. Rowing a boat was more tiring than the witcher expected. It was far easier when he was with Coral, since she would drive the boat forward with magic anyway. The sun was shining down warmly, but the winds of the sea were howling and cutting across anything they set their sights on. Icebergs of different shapes and sizes bobbed around the sea. Some were too small to even let anyone stand on, while some were as big as a drakkar. Islets dotted the seas like houses on a street, seagulls perching on them and making weird noises. Sailing in the fog were silhouettes of ships, their sails reflecting the sun's shine. Barrels trapped in a net floated around the sea, perhaps a shipment of a vessel long sunken. Roy rowed his boat closer to the barrels and knocked on one. The first thing he heard was the sloshing of liquid coming from within. A smile curled his lips, and he cut the net open, then he took a barrel onto his boat and summoned Arundite. The witcher poked a hole on the top of the barrel, and the scent of wine wafted into the air, filling the air with a tinge of sourness. Wine, eh? Roy leaned on the bow and put a hand behind his head, holding up a glass of wine. Then he took a sip. 
The Witcher basked in the whispers of the sea breeze, enjoying the show of dolphins leaping across the waters, their jumps a perfect performance. The boat swayed along with the waves, and Roy felt like he was on a swing. I could do this all day. But he didn't. Half an hour later, the Witcher, finally having his fill of food and rest, kept rowing toward Unvik. The island looked close, but it was still far away. Eventually the sun reached its zenith, and Roy's peaceful trip came to an end when his boat started to violently shake. The Witcher paused for a moment, his eyes going wide, his languid demeanor replaced by excitement. Roy tucked his oar away and quickly covered himself with Quen. A screech came from beneath, and the silhouette that had been ramming the boat broke through the surface, taking to the air. The sun shone on it, revealing a green, slender body. It was like a cobalt serpent, fully decked out with wings as big as a vampire's. On the tip of its wings, curved blades protruded. Its upper body resembled a woman, but only just. The claws on its elbow were curved as well, and black fur covered the back of its paws. The monster had a petite nose and an incisor-filled maw, its black hair covering its ears and eyes of bloodlust. The lower part of its body was a long, slender, and sharp tail, its green scales smooth and gleaming. Triangular fins jutted from both sides of the midsection of its tail. Echidna age, 5 years old, HP 150, mana, death, strength 13, dexterity 14, constitution 15, perception 12, will, charisma, spirit 5, skills, chimera, passive. Like harpies and arinias, both of which are close relatives to the echidna, this creature possesses the strengths of eagles and fish. They can fly and move in water, possess a powerful gut, giving them the ability to consume rotten and fresh meat. That includes human flesh. Plus four to dexterity, constitution, and perception. The echidna charged at the witcher like a gust of wind, the air howling as it launched into the offensive. A flash of white hurtled across the air, then the bolt rammed straight into the echidna's chest, blasting a bloody hole through its body. With a howl, the echidna fell. Roy bent down slightly and leapt at the falling creature, swinging his crimson blade down. Blood fell like a little downpour of rain, and the parts of the monster's corpse fell into the sea, drenching it red. Echidna killed. Plus 150 XP. Level 12 Witcher. Length and 500. Roy held up Erendite, its enchantment allowing the Witcher to walk on the sea. He then picked up the upper part of the dead echidna and hauled it back to the boat. Before he could cut it up, a blast echoed across the waters a few dozen yards away, where the undercurrents were. And then a group of echidnas appeared. The scent of their kin's blood whipped them into a frenzy, and they charged right at the Witcher without any care for their safety. Roy held Erendite in his right hand and Gabriel in his left. He stood on the surface of the sea, unmoving and unfazed, facing the monsters as they came. One, two, three, four, and five. The five echidnas let out horrible shrieks, their eyes glinting crimson as they surrounded the Witcher. Roy fired a bolt and disappeared into thin air, plunging the monsters into confusion. And then a howl pierced the air, as the blossom of a bloody flower tainted the air. The echidna in the center of this group had a hole in its chest, and a blade was buried in its skull from the top. Like a rider, Roy stood on its wings and pulled his blade out. He flicked the blood off Erendite, swaying as the monster struggled in its death throes, his hair billowing in the winds. Once again, the Witcher disappeared, and another echidna had its life taken away before it could even do anything. A bolt pierced through its body, and a blade sliced into its flesh. Like a kite without a string, it slowly fell into the sea, leaving nothing but blood and feathers behind. The remaining monsters couldn't even react to the Witcher's movements. They tried their best to attack, but none could predict where the Witcher would appear. They wanted to escape, but the bolts were faster. Another fell, then another, and another. Blood filled the air with quick succession as Roy darted around the monsters, quick as a bolt of deadly lightning. The Witcher's attacks even left afterimages from the sheer speed he was moving at. An invisible stage stood beneath the Witcher and the Echidnas. Like a reaper of souls, the Witcher danced around, swinging his blade of death at the souls of the damned, taking them into the afterlife. The battle, or to be exact, the massacre, came to an end in five seconds, and a few bloody corpses were floating on the sea. 
Roy stood on the surface of the waters, cleaning the blood on his body slowly, then he picked up the corpses and looted them, gaining three blue mutagens from the echidnas, five echidnas killed, plus 750 EXP, level 12 witcher, 12100 slash 2500. Roy sat on the bow of his boat and let out a loud whistle as he rowed the boat ahead again. At this rate, I should be able to fill my EXP bar before I get to Unvik. Chapter 518 the trouble of Clan Tordorach. The door and windows of the conference hall were shut tight. A trio of candelabras shone gently upon the room, but the look on the sorceress's face was icy. Her arms were crossed, and she was looking at a girl in a green floral dress who had a morose look on her face. A stack of papers with bizarre patterns on them, as well as a quill, sat on the table. We're going on with the magic test, you ugly duckling. Yennefer looked at Ciri, her violet eyes filled with solemn warning. Same requirement, answer them with honesty and resolve. But I don't want to go through the test anymore. Ciri fidgeted, the overly hard stool hurting her behind. Stubbornly, the girl protested. It's been three days, and the test takes up the whole afternoon. I keep having to draw stars, moons, animals, and houses that look like mazes. What does that have to do with magic, Lady Yennefer? I want to learn how to light candles with nothing but my hand. I want to learn how to breathe underwater. I want to learn how to make bread and water out of nothing when I'm hungry. And I want to learn how to fly like Griffin, not sit here drawing random art. Are you a sorceress or an artist? The test had gone on for three days, and Siri was getting stiff and sore from it, the soreness getting worse with each passing day. Yennefer's classes were a lot more boring than what she had in mind. She swore she was seeing stars at one point, but Yennefer wouldn't allow her to even lose focus. That was ridiculous. She was a child, so of course she would be distracted. Siri was starting to miss the days she could play with her friends in the yards, messing around with the chickens and Roy's dog. She missed seeing Keon and taking naps in the classroom. I'm going to say this once more. Magic is a multifaceted subject. It is an artanda form of science. Yennefer held Ciri's delicate hands and pried her fingers apart. If you do not learn how to draw, you'll be left with clumsy fingers. You'll be making gestures uglier than a toad. The other sorcerers will be laughing at you. And how do you know I have the talent for magic even before I am tested? Ciri crossed her arms and harumphed, swiveling on the stool and showing her back to Yennefer. The girl let out a childlike roar. I don't want to draw these stupid animals. I'm saying it. I don't have any talent for magic, and I don't want to learn magic anymore. Vetoed. Yennefer shook her head. Matter-of-factly, she said, You are fated to walk the path of magic. No, I want to learn how to swing a sword like Carl and Monty. And then the girl let out a gasp, clutching her reddening forehead. She sniffled, tears glistening in her eyes. Yennefer massaged her index finger. Have you forgotten what you promised Geralt and me? You'll do as you're told, even if the assignments are arduous. You'll keep pushing on in earnest, no matter how hard things get. It's just the third day now, and you're already going back on your word? Everyone's gonna look down on you if they know. The Witcher apprentices, the soon-to-be alchemists, the fledgling blacksmiths. You're a Sintren. You're known for facing challenges head-on. Show that spirit. This is child abuse, Grandma Yennefer. The air in the conference hall dropped a few degrees, and Yennefer shot the girl a dangerous look. You can't just order me around. Siri leapt out of the chair, looking up at Yennefer. She then realized she had a few points she could exploit, so she put her hands behind her back in an attempt to look more mature. Stubbornly, the girl stared into Yennefer's eyes and seriously said, First creed of the Brotherhood, equality. You want me to listen to you, then you have to follow that rule too. Yennefer chuckled. You have one thing wrong. I am not a part of the Brotherhood, but I've been genuine with you, you ugly duckling. And stop calling me that. The girls say that I'm the prettiest one around this place. I'm as pretty as Vicky herself. There are boys out there who like me, stole glances at me while I weigh, as moving around in the yard. Because they pity you. Yennefer pinched the girl's nose, her eyes flashing with sympathy, and Siri caught that. It made her nervous. They were thinking how could someone look so ugly, nose as big as a boy's, lips too thin, weird green eyes, and squiggly brows, 
they were wondering if you could marry yourself off someday. Um, be honest with me. Am I that ugly? Siri clasped her hands together before her chest and stared at Yennefer wide-eyed, her voice dejected. You can cry if you want, but you don't have to feel bad about it. Maybe someday you'll grow up to be a swan. I won't cry. You're trying to trick me again, aren't you? If you're really genuine with me, then answer my question. If you do, I'll go back to drawing. Mischief flitted within Siri's eyes. She was reminded of a certain something Roy told her. Ask away. I heard you have a wooden statue of a unicorn. I've had a go with a griffin, so can you magic the statue away and give it life so I can ride it? No, and you're going to forget about that. You are not allowed to mention it ever again. Reminded of a more colorful past, Yennefer's cheeks turned pink. Now go back to your seat. Take the quill and lay out the paper. You're drawing the obsidian I'm wearing around my neck now. Hey, that wasn't very genuine, Lady Yennefer. How come you and Geralt get to ride the unicorn, but I can't? That bastard told you the story? Geralt, she's just a child. Geralt was in the woods, watching over the children as they dug up potatoes. He sneezed and rubbed his nose, a feeling of unease welling in his heart. You've gotten old, Geralt. She's just one sorceress, and already you couldn't handle her? Lambert winked at Geralt. Might want to come to the Pike's Grotto with me and change things up. Sawed off. Geralt winced a little, and he was starting to wonder what he did wrong to annoy Yen. Waves crashed against the reef of the Skellige Isles, and Roy's boat slowly waded through the freezing waters, bumping into the golden sands gently. The bow broke through the soft sand, lodging itself into the ground. Golden rays of sunshine shone on the Witcher, lending a bit of glitter to his cloak. The Witcher had been rowing for two days, and the air around him was filled with the stench of blood and sweat. Roy quickly pulled the boat to a nearby bush and hid it there. He then dragged his feet across the sands and disappeared behind a row of weeping golden willows. Unvik was still a beautiful place, untainted by the ice giant that would rampage across its land ten years later, leaving nothing but desolation and dens of beasts in its wake. Thanks to its good geolocation, Undvik was the second most popular isles among the six, attracting a huge number of tourists every year to marvel at its beautiful scenery and feast on the best seafood and local delicacies. Roy sauntered down a path within the woods, signposts pointing where he needed to go. He ran into a wolf on his way to his destination. Well, the body of a wolf that was cleaved in two must be the handiwork of the locals. He noticed tourists ambling down the sides of the path. Judging from their fashion style, there were people from Redania, Temeria, and Adern. These tourists were even outnumbering the locals. An hour later, Roy finally came to a human settlement in the northern part of the island, Marlin Coast. The roads of the were huge, and around it were dozens of houses made of stone bricks. Along the streets, merchants of Skellige Isles trundled along, selling their wares. Some were homemade marlin pies, some were selling smoked whale meat, some peddled the isle's herbs, while some were selling colorful and beautiful trinkets. Useless stones and mementos. The witcher noticed one half-naked skellige man with a hat made out of auk feathers selling pickled shark meat. The stench from the fermented urine alone almost made Roy think there was a monster nearby. There were, of course, real and valuable merchandise, like ambergris and premium sturgeon caviar. On the flip side, there were also numerous types of bizarre products, a couple of them being Irinia jerky and Echidna jerky. These monsters were abundant around the isles, and Roy felt slightly amused seeing them. These monsters are slightly poisonous. Guess the islanders have great poison resistance. Roy came to a stop before a gaunt and tanned merchant. He spent ten coppers on a piece of pickled shark meat. It was gray and the size of his palm. The young witcher held his breath and tucked it away in his inventory space. Hope you like this present, kids. So how can I get to Clan Tortorok's turf? Their clan lives in Codtown. It's in the south near the mountains. Just follow the signposts and head south. You can't miss it. The merchant sized the witcher up. You want to buy something off him? Yes, buy some smoked whale meat and I'll give you an advice. What do you know, kids? More presents. The Tortoroks are proud fellas that I can tell you. Only sells the finest weapons to true warriors, said the merchant proudly. 
Tis why they always require potential clients to pass their trial. Only those who can pass the trial and prove their bravery can purchase their wares. Heard their family ran into some sort of trouble lately. Quite a few of their clansmen died. Reckon the trial's going to be tough. Can I buy my way through it? Ye can try, certainly. The clan's been heir for generations. Loves the art of blacksmithing as much as them Mahakam dwarves. Spent all their lives improving the art. Coin ain't mean nothing to em. I see. May Freya bless you. See you around. Codtown was a more bustling place compared to Marlin Coast. They had everything here, and tourists were a common sight on the streets. In the center of the town stood a building. Underneath the granite overhang was a blower and a forge with blazing flames within. A blacksmith with a leather apron and burly arms stood before the forge. In his left hand were a pair of tongs. The blacksmith used it to hold a long piece of metal on an anvil, hammering away at it while turning it around. Clangs of metal hitting against metal rang out in the air, his sweat glistening from the shine of the forge's flames. Sparks leapt onto his skin and stubble, but he was focused and undeterred, the pain failing to phase him. There was a rhythm to his work, like he was a conductor creating a new masterpiece. Roy was captivated by his movements, his heartbeat almost sinking to the beat of the blacksmith's hammer. Chamir Tortorach, age 45 years old, gender, male, status, master blacksmith, possesses blacksmithing skills on par with the dwarves, a master in armoring and weaponsmithing. There was a forge, anvil, whetstone, and workstation around him. Aside from that, there were also gardening tools and necessities like nails, a plow, bolts, rims, a hoe, a scythe, and pots and pans. A few mercenaries and warriors stood around the smithy, covered in chainmail, brigandine, or fur armor. The men were decked out with all manners of weapon or carrying a circular shield on their backs. They were also wearing winged helms. The men's eyes were glued to the master blacksmith, their harried and tired eyes filled with anticipation. Anticipation for the creation of a new, powerful weapon. And then the final strike. Shamir took away the metal that was starting to look like a sword. The witcher stepped into the smithy, passing by all the men outside. The mercenaries did not stop him. Instead, they gave the witcher looks of mockery and disdain. Hello, Shamir. My name is Alkis, here on a visit. The reputation of your clan's blacksmithing skills precedes. Shamir took his cotton gloves off and turned his attention to the witcher. With a voice as firm as the movements of his work, he said, Sorry, but the foundry's been inflicted with a heavy blow lately. We can't use the best forge to create the best weapons. No good item, I'm afraid. Only regular ones, and you have some rules to follow. Get to the back of the line. There was a hint of exhaustion in his eyes. To be honest, I'm not here to purchase anything. Roy shook his head, and he requested, I'd like to employ the services of your clan's better blacksmiths, you, for example, and have them work in another place. I can pay handsomely. Sorry, but that's not possible. There are only three good blacksmiths left in the family right now. For generations, we've lived in Unvik, used to everything this place has to offer, from its environment to the food. Can't go anywhere else. Shamir refused adamantly. The king himself and Cracks of Clan Crate has tried to employ our services, but we refused. Not to mention two of our kin are missing. A man with a big forehead and an even bigger nose roared raucously. Am I hearing things? The blasted punk thinks he can employ a master blacksmith's services? He'd be lucky to even purchase any of Clan Tortorok's items. That's enough, lad. You're making a fool out of yourself, a monster hunter said. Another burly man with chainmail armor and a warhammer roared, you're skinnier than me arm. Betcha can't even swing me hammer, and you think you can pass Chamir's trial? Get out of here before you make a fool of yourself. The men outside were jeering and mocking the young witcher, but he ignored them. I am of course not as influential as King Bran himself, but I also have a few blacksmiths back at my place. They would love to talk about the art of the trade over a few mugs of beer, and I am in possession of a precious blacksmithing component. Unvik, no, the Isles, no. Not even the whole continent has ever seen something quite like that, and I believe any blacksmith worth their salt would be interested in what I have to offer. Roy clenched his teeth and opened up his hand, revealing a piece of bone the size of his fist and a scale with a hue darker than night. 
The bone was covered with minute and exquisite runes. Shamir's unfazed expression was wiped off. He then carefully and nervously took the dragon scale and bone from Roy, holding it millimeters away from his face. Moments later, the master blacksmith was breathing heavily. The men outside the shop stopped bickering among themselves too, and then another man came out from a room within the smithy. He had golden hair that tumbled down his shoulders, and he donned expensive clothes. A young, lithe girl bobbed up and down while on the man's back, her ponytail swinging happily. What is it, Shamir? Another trouble, ma. And the man's eyes were fixed on the items his companion was holding, unable to look away. As if caught in a spell, he tried to figure out what manner of beast the scale and bone were gleaned from, and he muttered under his breath, Or, no, is it a bone? Not that either. Or is it alloy? No, no, no. I've never seen something quite like this. This needs a more thorough inspection. We need a more professional tool for this. A moment, please, Aukis. We'll be right back. The blacksmiths quickly went into the room with the components even before Roy could give them permission. Roy shook his head. He then turned his attention to the young lady, and his eyes shone, a little smile curling his lips. Joanna, Roy knew this girl. Nine years down the line, she would be working for a dwarf in Crow's Perch. Nine years later, she would become a master blacksmith. Now she was but a fifteen-year-old girl. She would have a slightly freckled face in the future, but now her skin was as smooth as porcelain. Despite her youthful looks, her blacksmithing was already at level eight. Talented. Very talented. She'll be a master blacksmith for sure. The witcher's passionate gaze did not scare the girl. Instead, she puffed her chest. Trying to get your hands on the world's best gear, Aukis? Then you must first prove your caliber as a warrior, or you're nothing but another scallywag who can only buy the regular items. I see. Curiosity flared within Roy's heart. How should I prove my caliber, then? I heard your clan always comes up with a trial. Ioana turned around and pursed her lips, worry flitting in her eyes. The best blacksmith of the fam, Eli, Farik, led four warriors into the foundry and mine in the northern mountains. They were supposed to make something out of the components, yet they never came back. And then Okala gathered another team to search for them, and they didn't come back either. I suspect we have a monster infestation there. She took a deep breath and raised her voice. If you can find my uncles and take them back, dead or alive, then we will create a piece of the best gear you can ever find, free of charge. But of course, should my uncles be dead, then you must avenge them. The hunter outside interrupted. I say ye stay out of this, lad. Two fully armed teams charged into the mine in search for them missing Tortorox, and none came back. From what I've heard, them warriors are veterans, experienced, powerful, killed even Echidnas and Irinias too, but they ain't even got a chance to come back with news. That mine in the north is a danger zone now. No one in Unvik's gonna go there. Think it through. Them gear might be great, but it ain't worth throwing your life away for. Roy mused over it. From what I know, the ice giant hibernating in the mountains won't wake until a few years later. Only then will it start to attack human settlements and kidnap the people and their livestock. That's the reason this whole place turned into hell. If the ice giant had woken up at this point, the coast and this whole village would have been destroyed. Perhaps they ran into something else. Alkes. Shamir's father and Joanna's father came out of their room, reluctantly handing the components back to Roy. What manner of beasts did you get these from? They're of better quality than any components I know. If I give you the answer and let you do whatever you want with these components, will you let one of your blacksmiths come with me to Novigrad? Roy asked. A tempting offer, but we're sorry. The blacksmiths exchanged a look and shook their heads. Our clan is getting smaller by the day, and we can't afford to lose any more members. Roy scanned his EXP bar, filled. He had confidence, and he asked, What if I were to search for Farak and Okala and come back with them? I can't guarantee they'll be alive, but I'll bring them back. Shamir froze for a moment. In disbelief, he asked, Is that a joke? That is reckless bravado, not bravery. Charging into the mountains alone is nothing short of a suicide mission. Unparalleled bravery. That's what the Isles are famous for. If I were to die, then I have nothing but my own weakness to blame. Shamir and Ioana's father exchanged another look. 
If you insist, then we shall only say this. You have our gratitude. Claff gazed at the Witcher. This is the map leading to the Forge, Aukis. If you can single-handedly return with Farrakh and Okala, then in the name of my clan, I shall travel to Novigrad with you and take up the mantle of your personal blacksmith. I think that's a fair enough arrangement, even with my clan's esteem. We have a deal. May Freya bless you. Chapter 519 Ice Troll Bear Blacksmith Unvix Mountains were not as vast as the Dragon Mountains or the Blue Mountains. To be exact, the whole island was smaller than any great city of the four northern kingdoms. The mountains were draped in a layer of snow, yet there was no perpetual fog shrouding its land, nor did it have any lush greenery. There was nothing but hard, protruding stone formations. The afternoon sun hung high in the skies, shining down upon no man's land. Roy was ascending a narrow, meandering stone staircase. Given its distance from ore-rich places like Mahakan and Povis and Kovir, the imported ore's prices skyrocketed to exorbitant levels. More than a century ago, Clan Tortorok found a mine to satisfy their blacksmithing needs, though the reserves weren't as abundant as they'd hoped. Every year after spring, the blacksmiths of the clan would enter the mountains for three months, creating the best weapons and armor with their ancestral forge. They would be accompanied by those who wished to purchase said items. Until now, the rulers of these isles changed multiple times, but this tradition of the clan had never changed. Until now. Hours had gone by since the young witcher ascended the staircase, the woods and buildings underneath nothing but specks now. He could barely see them clearly. The temperature had reached freezing point, and the air was getting thinner as the altitude got higher. Then the witcher froze. The path leading up to the mountainside had a crimson-brown patch on it. Judging from the shape, it was a projectile stain and had been here for at least a week. The witcher scooped up a bit of the blood-stained soil and sniffed it. Human blood. Fits Joanna's description. Probably from a member of the search party, haphazard footsteps were sighted near the bloodstain, all belonging to different types of boots. And there were also sets of non-humanoid footsteps. It was obvious that the feet of these creatures had paw pads, and they were a lot heavier than the average humans. That would explain why the prints were deeper embedded into the soil. Roy fell into his thoughts. No, not a giant. More like a bear. Judging from its size, it's about ten feet from head to toe, about five foot three in height if it's walking on all fours. All right, it's a giant. Could this attack on the blacksmith be a bear assault? The witcher followed the trail of blood and footprints, and they led him into a dark mine. The mine was deep and gigantic. Sturdy pine logs were made into wooden scaffolding to hold up the chamber's roof and walls. The paths in the mine sprawled around, weaving and winding into a maze. On the sides of the walls were clear marks of digging. Sacks of refuse and rusted pickaxes were strewn across the path. Every few yards, there were torches hanging from the wall, and the witcher snapped his fingers, lighting them up. Illumination filled the passage. The mine wasn't exactly stuffy or closed in. Roy could feel a gust of cold air coming from the other end of the darkness. He followed the faint smell of blood down the trail. Footprints were all over the paths, and they alternated between the different levels of the mine. Roy also noticed claw marks on the walls. Bear claws. About half an hour later, he found another patch of dried blood on an inky ore. There was also a sliver of frozen mincemeat on it. Roy poked at it and took a whiff. Human male. Dead. More than probably. There were marks of a fight around the mincemeat. Shards of smashed boulders, tattered clothes, and weapons that were cleaved in half. The enemy's strength and defense must be incredible. To the witcher's surprise, there was a third set of footprints, or hooves, as the witcher thought. Three toes, elliptical, just like an ogre. Could there be an ice troll here? If that's the case, then it's no wonder the search parties got wiped out. Roy came up with a plan. He sat down cross-legged and whipped out a bottle of ogroid oil and a bottle of frostbite spider venom he got from Skyrim, as well as a bottle of paralyzing no potion. He lathered it over erandite, and the blade started to gleam and shine. Roy brushed his finger against the blade, and the metal sang. Like a cat, the witcher crouched a little, following a little trail that the creature left behind. A while later, Roy was met with a bright light, 
and the air was filled with some weird stench. He slowed his breathing for a moment. A giant furnace the size of a pond stood beside the walls of the cave, and a bonfire was burning brightly beside it. A gigantic pine tree stood beside the fire, a great cauldron hanging from its branch. So big was the cauldron, a regular adult could sit in it easily. Something was stewing in the cauldron, filling the air with heat and aroma. Roy hid behind a boulder and sniffed the air. Meat, mandrake roots, basil, bizarre herbs, roots, butts, ale, and a ton of different ingredients inside. Whatever was cooking within smelled like great food and socks that'd been in the gutter for weeks. It made Roy's stomach churn on more levels than one. Further on the left of the cauldron were a pair of silhouettes standing together, the light of the bonfire projecting their shadows onto the wall. The creatures were about eight feet tall, most of their bodies covered in green ice. Their bellies, however, were round, yellow, ka, and protruding, not unlike pregnant women. On their backs was armor as big as a tortoise's shell. Their heads were bald, their eyes beady and listless, their noses were almost flattened, their fangs yellow. These creatures looked almost silly, but ice troll age, 89 years old, gender male, HP 300, strength 30, dexterity 12, constitution 30, perception 14, will 9, charisma 3, spirit 8, skills, regeneration passive, all ogroids possess powerful self-regenerative abilities. Their metabolic rate far outstrips a lot of species. Any non-lethal wounds heal up in the blink of an eye. Immune to bleeding. Unlike rock trolls, Ice trolls have no outward weaknesses. Stone Toss Mastery Level 8. Freezing Physique. Passive. Ice trolls have great strength and sturdy bodies, highly resistant to physical attacks. Sharp weapons are ineffective against them and will dull easily. Plus 10 to constitution and strength. Battle power increases in cold weather. Even from afar, Roy looked solemn. There were no bears around, but the ice trolls alone were formidable enough. They had 30 points in constitution, effectively giving them sturdy armor. And with their strength, Quen would break in one hit, and then his ribs would be broken too. With how claustrophobic this place is, these trolls just became that much more dangerous, and we have a pair too. The female's obviously bigger, and she's on par with her mate. The ice trolls were staring at the cauldron of stew, drool dribbling down their disgusting teeth. They couldn't wait to dig into their feast. Roy stared past the trolls and looked at what was behind them. There was a circular stone table surrounded by skeletons. Even from ten yards away, Roy could see that the skeletons belonged to animals of different types. Wolves, foxes, goats, falcons, and even humans. About a dozen humans. A few frozen human corpses lay beside the skeletons. Their flesh was intact, but one of them had lost an arm and a leg. I think I have an idea where the missing parts are. Roy looked at the cauldron. A steel cage sat by its lonesome in the other corner of the chamber, taken up by one unkempt man. His golden hair was greasy and clumpy, covering most of his head, revealing only his wide, taut jaw. His oversized hands gripped the steel bars with all their might. His face squeezed against the bars as his eyes were fixed on the cauldron. He seemed tremulous, perhaps from fear, the witcher surmised. He wore a grayish-white jacket, his body shivering. A steel plate covered in frost sat outside his cage. Looks like he's been treated as a pet. Farak Tordorok, age 48 years old, gender male. Status, master blacksmith, HP 4080, weakened, starving. Oh, that's one of Ioana's uncles. Man, he has a mountain of debuffs. Delight flared within the witcher's heart, but he frowned. It's been more than a month, and this guy is still alive, but everyone else is gone. Didn't find anyone in the foundry or mine. Something's off. Why'd the trolls lock him up in a cage? The stew was starting to simmer, its juice sloshing around, vaporized the moment it touched the fire, and the scent wafting in the air turned a shade richer. Roy stared at the roaring blaze, and he fell into his thoughts. If these were rock trolls, he would have gone out with his hands raised so he could start a negotiation. Serret's wonderful work of literature on trolls would be enough to tide him through the pinch. Ice trolls, however, were different. The unforgiving climate and terrain they lived in further impacted their already unimpressive brains, turning them into mindless beasts who were driven by the feral desire to kill and feed. They were creatures of impulse. The only way to survive an encounter was to do as they were told, or else, 
These beasts are harder to get through than the trolls on Kaer Morin. Me smell summon bad. Sumat small people came, the male troll muttered, but his voice boomed, the tenor of his voice filled with a special rhythm. No, not same as small people. He's sharp, shocked. Roy slowed down his breathing even further, then he quickly cast Heliotrop on top of Quen to hide his presence more. You're starving! The female sniffed the air and shook her head, then she let out a laugh that came from her belly. She scooped up a handful of snow to douse the fire, then she rolled the crank to lower the cauldron. She then pulled out a long metal ladle from the furnace and stirred the bizarre stew, happily singing a weird tune. One, two, three, she chuckled. One, two, three, she chortled. The troll, for some inexplicable reason, counted out loud for eight rounds before she sprinkled a hearty amount of some weird green powder into the mixture. She took a deep breath, an ugly smile cracking across her grotesque lips. She looked content with herself, like she just made some gourmet food. The troll ladled the yellow stew and filled two steel bowls up, the scalding juice splattering all across her belly, but she didn't react to it. The bowls were filled with oval hearts, long intestines, and a few succulent ribs. They did not look like animal ribs, however. Unfazed by the stew's scalding heat, the female troll dipped her ice-covered hand into the stew and pulled out a piece of rib, and she munched into it. The beast sat on the ice-cold floor, chomping down on the ribs, strips of muscle pulled apart at the joints of the bones. Roy covered his mouth. He'd seen a lot of things throughout his adventures, but this was nauseating. The male troll, however, was in no hurry to indulge himself. Instead, he took the plate at the cage and ladled it full of the stew. Then he handed it to Farak, and the blacksmith picked up a key from beside the cage. Then he unlocked it. Roy frowned. The trolls didn't lock him up. He did it to himself. Eat, big one. Snailies, deer, foxies, small ones, carrots inside. Smell bad and good. The male troll pointed his pudgy finger into his maw, a terrifying smile cracking his lips. He motioned to Farak, telling him to dig in. Eat, big one. Get bigger. Roy gulped. The trolls must think he's one of them. Can't explain why they'd call a shrimp like that big one. Farrakh pulled his fringe back, revealing a cadaverous face and eyes filled with hunger. With a trembling hand, he took the plate into his cage, and hesitation flickered in his eyes. It only lasted for a moment. The blacksmith heaved a long sigh and picked up a rib, then he munched into it. There were tears glistening in his eyes. Roy froze at the sight of that, and a conflicted look crept onto his face. The blacksmith had given up part of his humanity to survive, and the complex relationship between him and the trolls was hard to understand. Roy slid his blade back into its scabbard. First, I'll find out what happened here. Then I'll make my move. He crouched, head further, and waited for an opening. The ice trolls led simple lives. After a hearty meal came the highlight of the day, sleeping. Once they cleaned out the cauldron, the trolls leaned on it and dozed off, their snores almost rumbling the whole cave. The blacksmith sat in his cage, a vacant look filling his eyes, and he looked into the air numbly, where the flames flickered. All of a sudden, something cold clasped itself onto his back, and someone covered his mouth. Farak's heart skipped a beat, and he tried to break free. Hold still. Shamir and Klaff sent me. The mention of his clansmen eased the blacksmith up. He was then swiveled around and met with a young man. We'll talk, but first we need to get out of here, Roy whispered. Light shone through Farrakh's dead, murky eyes, but only for a moment. Fear took over, and he shook his head. Roy didn't give him any chance to dawdle. He quickly cast Axie, and the blacksmith followed him like an obedient pet. He couldn't leave just like that, so he locked a frozen corpse in the cage and had it pretend to be Farrakh. I'll buy us as much time as possible. Worried that Farak might get too loud and wake the trolls up, Roy took him on his back and tiptoed around the beasts. Reminds me of that trip in Mahakam. Roy glanced at the troll, fury flaring in his eyes. He had half the mind to use his energy attack to take one of the trolls out, but he gave up on that plan. Instead of going back through the path he came, the Witcher delved deeper into the mine, seeking the spot where the wind blew in. Ten minutes later, they emerged from the dark chambers and entered a snow-covered clearing in the back of the mountains. A rickety wooden shack stood by the cliff, and Roy took Farrakh into the house. He started a little fire to warm things up. 
Once Farak had healed up, it was time for a long talk. Who are you? Aukus, I'm a witcher, and your clansmen sent me here. Roy looked into Farak's eyes. I know it's a long story, but I need you to make it short. What happened after you and the warriors went into the mountains a month ago? Did the trolls attack you guys? No, that wasn't it. Farak paused for a few moments, but then Roy cast Axii, and he answered honestly. As per the clan's tradition, the warriors who wished to purchase Tordorok items and I came into the mountains for some metal casting. Things went well at first, but one day later, panic flared in Farak's eyes. One of the five warriors went missing. Roy massaged his temples, something's off. We searched the whole mine and its vicinity, but we found nothing, no blood nor corpse. We thought he got lost in the mountains, so we gave up on the search a while later. The blacksmithing must go on, after all. And then came the third day, and another warrior went missing. No sign of blood or corpse either. It was then everyone realized something was wrong. Curiosity flickered in Roy's eyes. Did the trolls get into a game of hide-and-seek with them? The Redanian warrior had a feeling we were in grave danger. Something terrible had set its sight on us. He gave up on his purchase and wished to descend the mountains immediately. But the moment he made that suggestion, Ibaira, a warrior from Ard Skellig, turned. Farak's voice trembled, and he almost failed to finish his sentence. He stared into the air, his eyes flickering with fear, and he shivered. He turned into a bear. Are you sure you weren't hallucinating? Roy cocked his eyebrow, and he was reminded of the claw he saw during his investigation. Someone from Ard Skellig turned into a bear? I am sure of it. It had crimson eyes, and everything about it smelled of violence. Smacked the Redanian warrior's sword away with a single swipe of its claw, and then the beast ripped the warrior open, spilling his guts everywhere. Then it roared and chased us deeper into the mine. The remaining Kidwenian warrior and I hid around the furnace, fearing for our lives. We had not the courage to face the bear, no, lost even the guts to swing our swords. The beast was far babe, jigger than anything I've seen, as big as a carriage when it stands on all fours, paws big enough to hold an adult man, maw filled with sharp incisors, and eyes red as blood. Nightmare fuel, I tell you. So if the bear killed the first team, what's the deal with the man-eating trolls? Farrakh froze for a moment, his eyes flickering with confusion and hesitation. Then he adamantly said, the trolls only came after the bear. Probably smelled the blood and came to claim the mine for themselves. Took us as prisoners and locked us up, then they wanted us to solve a riddle. A weird look flared in Farak's eyes. There was gratitude, but there was also fear and distance. A shame the Cadwanian warrior said the wrong answer, and they made him into frozen meat. So you answered correctly? Farak nodded. Yes, but they didn't release me, locked me up, and treated me like one of their own. Roy cocked his eyebrow, sizing the gaunt blacksmith up. He does not look like a troll at all. So why'd you lock yourself up instead of running away when the trolls are asleep? Because I was scared. I was scared the bear might come back. I had no other way to protect myself. So you're saying the bear is hiding somewhere nearby? How are you so sure of that? I can feel it, don't you understand? I can't run, or I buyer the bear will find me and tear me apart. I must stay in the cave. Only under the troll's protection can I be safe. Roy looked at the blacksmith again. That bear must have scared the guy out of his wits. Trying to ask for a troll's protection, they're going to end up eating you. Farak took a deep breath, sorrow filling his face. And I remember two rescue teams coming in to save me, one of them led by my poor brother, Okala. They attacked the trolls right away, thinking they were enemies. The trolls killed them with boulders and ice, then they became food. Farak looked grim, his eyes filled with regret, and he shook his head. I had no choice. I am but a regular blacksmith. I am just a human. I could never fight a troll. I don't want to die. The trolls can attack from a range. No one can stop them. You saw them too, didn't you? They see me as one of them, and they stubbornly think I have to eat them things they do, and I was starving. So. Roy pursed his lips. He was in no position to comment on the actions of a human trapped in a desperate situation. I have a question. Why'd they call you Big One? I, I'm not sure myself. Farrakh looked bemused. But I wasn't this gaunt a month ago. 
toiling in the forge for years gave me a powerful body. Roy scanned the bonfire in the house. Fine, I get it. You locked yourself up because you're worried the bear might come back for you, but you still got out of the mine safely now. And it's been more than a month. It should be gone now, so come back to town with me. No, it's going to come for me. It's going to come for us before we can even get home. Ah, and it'll tear me apart. Farak cringed and looked around nervously, as if he could see a bear hiding in a dark corner, keeping its eyes on him. Please, let me go back to my ka. Roy smacked the back of Farak's head. The blacksmith's eyes rolled back, and he fell unconscious. The witcher mused. His fear for the bear has turned into a phobia. Something's off, but he shouldn't have been lying, given that Axie was in effect. Roy came out of the house and placed Guayer on the door. Should something come in contact with his sword, he could teleport back right away. Then he looked at the cave. There are a lot of holes in Farak's story. This might be risky, but I need to look for the truth myself. Chapter 520 Shapeshift The light of the forge's flames shone upon the solemn countenance of a witcher. A cork plopped to the ground, and Roy downed a dose of echidna decoction and thunderbolt. His strength went from sixteen to twenty, and black blood flowed within his veins. Roy then uncorked Skelligile's specialty, cherry cider, and the scent of the alcohol spread across the chamber around the forge. The ice trolls sniffed the air and smacked their lips. A moment later, they wobbled and opened their eyes an infinitesimal amount. The first thing they saw was a cloaked figure standing at the entrance to the mine. Who you ugly? Out! This troll home! The trolls stood up and slammed their overgrown arms against the ground. Or troll cook you! The male troll bellowed, his voice thundering like a war drum. No, he smelled delish! The female troll drooled and licked her lips. Then she grabbed a boulder as big as a punching bag and got into a throwing stance. No run! Come, I bite you! So should I just run or nah? Roy muttered, You pigs fell asleep after a meal. Heck, you look like pigs and you're calling me ugly? Have you ever looked into a mirror? He raised his hands, telling them he came in peace. Then he pointed at the frozen corpse in the cage. Take a deep breath and calm down. I'm a friend of big one. Here's a little gift. Roy rolled the spiked cider over to the trolls. Trolls could never resist alcohol. The monsters exchanged a look, and the male troll picked up the bottle without even hesitating. However, his fingers were too stubby for him to even uncork the bottle, so he ripped the bottle in two and gulped down the cider. His partner quickly, his partner quickly snatched the other half. You had my wine, so we're friends now. And I have a question. Piss off! The troll shot Roy a glare and refused to accept the gesture. Adamantly, it said, You smell funny, not friend. No wine, no questions. Wine or become meat, the female troll was drooling, and a guttural growl came from her throat. She was holding back her desire to feed. Roy tossed another bottle of wine. So how long have you guys been living in this place? The female troll downed the cider and licked the empty bottle. Then she counted. One, two, three. One, two, three. Stop. Another question. Big one said there's a bear in this mine. Where is it? Bear. Friend, eat small ones. The male troll howled in delight and looked at the cage. When he noticed the frozen corpse, he gave it a look of suspicion. Big one looks different. Noticing the look in the troll's eyes, Roy froze for a moment. What does the bear have to do with the blacksmith? You got into a fight with the bear, trying to eat its paw? Bear paw bad, small one's better. Bear friend, no fight. The troll burped. Kill small ones together. Make stew. Roy got the gist of the matter. The trolls aren't enemies with the bear. They're partners. That's a lot different from what Farak told me. Where's your bear friend? Take me to him. I can get all of them at once. Roy rolled another bottle of liquor over to them. Bear friend hiding. The dazed troll looked at the cage. Then it turned its attention to the witcher, its eyes blazing with desire and hunger. Only come out after taking drug. Kill small ones together. Eat them together. What kind of drugs? The troll scratched the back of its head, looking at the pile of miscellaneous items around the cage, muttering something under its breath. There was impatience in its voice, as if it were on the verge of letting something loose. The witcher looked where it was looking, and he noticed a bottle of mead and a few freezing crimson psilocybe mushrooms around the cage. One of them had bite marks on it, and that reminded the witcher of a certain race living in Ard Skellig, 
active Wildkarls, Berserkers. Could the bear be? The female troll finished the liquor. Finally having its fill, she turned her bloodshot eyes to the witcher, misty breath flaring from her nostrils, and drool dribbled down her teeth. She then gripped a boulder, and her muscles bulged. Had a lot frozen meat. Change food. Fresh small ones. The boulder whizzed through the air like a lightning bolt, charging at the witcher. Roy anticipated that. He sidestepped it and leapt onto a protruding boulder. The projectile slammed into the cave's wall, and it crumbled from the impact, leaving a hole on the wall. As if on cue, the troll charged at Roy, swinging his arms around. The air was filled with its stench, and it slammed into where Roy was standing, creating a human-shaped hole in the wall. Debris and stones flew everywhere, the troll hammering away at the wall. At the same time, its partner stood on the sidelines, hurling boulders and ice shards through the air, almost creating a gray rainbow. So powerful was the impact of the projectiles, they left a row of holes in the wall. The witcher ducked, dove, dipped, and dodged the incoming projectiles, spinning and pirouetting around the cave as if he were dancing in a rain of stones and ice. Then the witcher grabbed his hand crossbow and pulled the trigger. A bolt flew through the battlefield, ramming straight into the female's left eye, the impact blasting her left socket into a crater. Most creatures would have had their heads blasted clean off, but the troll only let out a howl of agony as it lost sight in one eye. That only served to stoke its flames of vengeance further. But before she could do anything, the witcher disappeared into thin air, taking with him the golden light and crimson flames flickering on his skin. The air rippled, and Roy reappeared right before her exposed torso, murder flaring in his eyes. I gave you liquor, and I got murder in return. Very well. If this is what you want, then two can play the game. Roy made a sign, and the troll froze for a moment. That split second was all Roy needed. He sliced his poison blade across the troll's waist, the stars on the sword losing their light. A wave of crimson energy darted ahead, slicing through the troll's belly, cutting through its innards and crushing its spine. Even its sturdy shell was cut open by Roy's energy slash. The troll let out a howl of agony. Moments before its death, it swung one punch at Roy. So fast was its attack, Roy failed to escape, and the punch grazed him. It broke Quen, caved his armor in, and broke his right arm, bending it at an unnatural angle. He was sent flying across the air, and was only stopped when he slammed into the wall. His blade fell from his hand, and Roy plopped on the ground, the pain from his broken bones turning his face red. The witcher pressed down on his right shoulder, and an audible crack rang in the air. Ring of Time, his elder blood raged and boiled as the power of time enveloped the Witcher. He turned back time around him by twenty seconds, healing all the damage done by the troll. His missing health, his hit points, and his limping right arm returned to full health. Roy spun his shoulder and checked the battlefield out. The female troll was in a bad state. Two halves of her body slid and fell like slices of expired and overgrown meat. Blood spilled from her wound, drenching the ground and filling the air with a rancid stench, yet she did not die just yet. Her unbelievably abundant life force tethered her to the land of the living. In agony, she clawed away at the ground until her nails started to peel away, and the debris was sent flying. As it raged and flailed and screamed in pain, its mate charged at the witcher, the sight of the female troll's agony whipping him into a rage. Roy pressed his left hand against the ground and cast his conjuration spell. A blue frost atronach leapt out of oblivion and crossed its arms, standing before its summoner like an ardent shield. The troll slammed into the immovable atronach, and the cave shook from the shock, a dust storm swirling in the air. Icicles fell from the roof, and the howling gale almost blew out the flames in the forge. Unbelievably, the charge left an infinitesimal crack on the atronach's armor. Driven by bereavement, the male troll drew heavily from its well of strength, but insti, d of going after Roy, it charged right at the frost atronach and slammed its fists into the minion again and again, its face contorted with rage. He hurled his punches until they left after images, the roar of the battle's impact rumbling across the cave. The atronach could not hold out against the troll's relentless attack. It tried to defend, but the troll proved to be too powerful. Eventually, Cracks spread across its body, 
and shards of ice splattered across the battlefield. The Witcher, hiding behind the minion, cast another spell, and his eyes turned red. Crimson tentacles bloomed in the air like a flower of death, swaying in the gale. They stopped the troll's attack and coiled around it until it was a cocoon. Then the tentacles raised the troll into the air, revealing its belly and eyes to the Witcher. Roy held his sword up and stabbed away at the troll's eyes and belly, while his minion slammed its fists into the troll's head. In just a moment, the troll was covered in bruises, its eyes bursting into a gooey mess and its stomach a wall of bloody gashes. Its innards were torn, and two halves of its guts spilled out to the ground. The poison from the blade and the flames from the armor cut into his wounds further, leaving deeper injuries, and blood spurted like a fountain. Yet even so, the troll was regenerating at inhuman speeds, especially in a climate as cold as the caves. The wounds on its belly were quickly closing up. These wounds were not enough to kill the troll. Right before fear's effect wore off, the witcher gritted his teeth and held the troll's shoulder down. He then pulled the troll's head closer, and the witcher took a deep breath. Fuzz! A gash tore itself in space as the power from the bones of the earth descended into this world. A great current of air and sonic waves blasted into the troll's ear canal. As if slammed by a siege weapon, the troll hurtled across the air, but even before it could land, its flesh ricocheted in every direction. A bloody scene unfurled before the witcher's eyes as something exploded in the troll's ear. The impact from the blow blasted its ear and half its face off. Its flesh was sliced off by an invisible knife, revealing its bloody flesh within. The impact destroyed the eardrums and charged straight into its head, destroying its bones and brains before leaving a gaping hole behind. Blood and brains trickled down its body as the troll fell, its pupils dilating while its last breath left its body. Not even its regenerative abilities could heal up its mess of a brain now. 2. Ice Trolls Killed Plus 600 XP Level 12 Witcher 13 800 2500 Roy wiped the sweat off his forehead and looked at the mangled corpses of the trolls. He shook his head. You deserve this. Taking over the mines alone was bad enough, but you just had to kill and eat all those people. Can't believe you tried to eat me too. The witcher took a deep breath and cut the trolls' bodies up. Time to get the loot. The trolls' hides were as tough as steel. If it weren't for their soft bellies, Roy would have to cut through their corpses with his energy attack. It didn't take long for the Witcher to gather all the innards, bones, and corpses, then he tucked all of them away in his inventory space. And the trolls also dropped a couple of ogroid mutagens. These were on par with greater green mutagens. Roy searched the forge's vicinity, but he still found no other living humans. He then collected some trinkets off the corpses. Statues, hats, daggers, hair clips with names engraved on it all things that could prove the deceased's identity, and coins worth more than 500 crowns. The trolls hid the coins in a sack. They probably had the hobby of collecting shiny items, much like how dragons would. And Roy also found the bottle of mead around the cage. It was supposed to be pure mead, but there were traces of dried blood at the bottle's throat. A few psilocybe mushrooms were strewn around the cage. Maybe someone found these around the mountains. Mushrooms and mead. Anyone who has this combination will LD have an insane trip. Psilocybe mushrooms, human blood, mead, and a bear. My guess is right on the money. Farak probably inadvertently ingested the three components and awakened his hidden strength. Roy rubbed his chin. Maybe that's why he was so scared. He then went back to the shack outside the mine. The sun was slowly descending on the west coast, the snow-capped mountains reflecting the last beautiful rays of sunshine as dusk slowly closed in. Roy patted Farak's cheek. The blacksmith muttered and woke from his slumber. Ocus, did I fall asleep? He was curled up, his eyes bloodshot and filled with fear. Carefully, he looked around, fearing something might be keeping an eye on him, ready to pounce at any given moment. I searched the place, but I didn't see any bears, because it hides well. Farak looked into the witcher's eyes solemnly, almost spewing all over his face. Oh gods! This man feasted with the trolls before, disgust welled in the witcher's heart. It'll appear when we least expect it, and kill us all. He put his hands in a prayer, pleading, Please, witcher, take me back to the cave and lock me up in the cage. 
Only the trolls can protect me now. You sure taking you back home won't work either? Roy looked into his eyes, trying to find a trace of guilt. You'd be far from the mountains and with your family. Joanna, Chamir, and Claff will keep you safe. The bear can't hurt you. It's not as simple as you think. A bitter look filled Farak's eyes. Worried, it said, it can track me down through my scent and invade my home. It'll kill my family. I'm sorry to tell you this, but Roy waved his arm and produced two ice troll corpses beside the bonfire, their innards cleaned out. Your guards are gone. The blacksmith's eyes went wide, and he was in disbelief. Well, more horrified than in disbelief. He pointed at the corpses, unable to form a coherent sentence, and he inhaled sharply. I killed them. They tried to eat me, but I'm a tough customer, so their heads got busted. I'm done for, Aukus. I'm done for. The blacksmith started crying like a jilted woman. No one can save me now. I'm dead, and I still haven't raised a family yet. Gods, I'm still single. Ah, don't worry. If that bear shows up, I'll make bear stew out of it. And Guff Roy tossed a few pieces of firewood into the bonfire, slashing his hand around. Coldly, he said, I've not just killed trolls before. Neckers, ghouls, and even a higher vampire, too. Killed them all, and bears as well. Brown bears, grizzly bears, or even believers of Svalblad, so-called Vildkarls, berserkers. You will die if you do that, Aukus, Farak rebutted. Then he gave Roy a confused look. What do you mean, Svalblad? Think harder. You must have the answer. Roy smiled at him mysteriously. Svalblad? Vildkarls? Berserkers? Farak stared at the ground, muttering. A frown furrowed his brows, and confusion filled his eyes. He didn't seem to be lying. Can't remember anything? Let me jog your memory. Roy produced a bottle of mead and uncorked it. He crushed a celesibe mushroom and poured the shroom into the mead. The witcher let the flavors get to know each other for a moment and handed the bottle over to Farak. Farak frowned, the look in his eyes turning vacant as he fell into a memory lane. Without thinking, he took the bottle and had a sip. As the liquid merged with his body, the blacksmith tensed up. He bit his lip tightly and held his breath, his teeth clenched together. All his timid and cowardly nature was gone, replaced by an icy look of cruelty. A sickly red tinged his ghostly pale skin, the air coming out of his mouth hot, as if he had a fever. Veins popped underneath his skin. Even with the bonfire, the climate was still deathly freezing, but Farak seemed to be in a sweltering land, tearing away at his coat to feel cooler. His bony torso was revealed, and he lay on the ground like a beast, shivering. Roy's pupils contracted. Black fur slithered out of the blacksmith's pores, slowly covering him, turning the man into a beast. His cadaver, Rouse figure ballooned, and claws extended from the tips of his limbs. His pupils contracted, their color deepening. Farrick's mouth elongated into a snout, his teeth giving way to thick, yellow fangs with crimson strips around their tips. A pool of drool was starting to form on the ground. The beast gnashed its teeth, its eyes shining with crimson bloodlust. Then it whirled and looked at the snow-capped ground with eyes devoid of any emotion. Roy had exited the shack, standing far away, blending into the night. A terrible roar rampaged across the air of the mountains, and within the bear, the urge to battle and destroy awakened. A beast ten feet tall emerged from the shack, growling. 